All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the uh, session on Java uh, streams versus reactive streams, which, when, how, and why. My name is Venkat Subramaniam. We're going to talk about two different things here. One, one is, of course, what we're all uh, uh, used to in Java, which is the Java 8 streams. We'll talk about that a little bit first. So here's a list of topics I want to cover today. So we'll talk a bit about uh, Java 8 streams, some of the reasons to use it, but also some of the limitations we're going to run into when it comes to using Java streams. And then we'll talk about reactive programming and reactive systems a little bit. Uh, uh, I'll mostly talk about the concepts behind reactive programming, why we are interested in this, uh, where uh, the world is heading towards uh, reactive applications. Then I'll talk a bit about a Reactive Streams API that's been introduced several years ago and uh, compare and contrast that quite a bit with Java Streams. And I'll tr uh, try to draw the parallel between them. I'll talk about what is similar between Java Streams versus Reactive Streams. I'll talk about what's different between them as well. And then, of course, uh, we'll look at some code examples along the way. And then finally, we'll talk about, uh, you know, hey, that's great, we have Reactive Streams API, but Java 9 also has a Reactive Streams API. Uh, how is it different? How is it similar? Which one should we use? How, you know, how do we go about moving forward uh, into Java 9, Java 10, and, and future of Java? How are we going to really do that? Uh, so that's exactly what we're going to be focusing on today. We, we're going to spend about an hour and 15 minutes of, of, in the first part, and then we'll take about a 15 minutes break. And then we'll go for the second part right after that. It gives an opportunity for you to stretch a little bit as well in the meantime. So let's get started. Well, we're going to talk about Java streams, first of all. And, and, and I have to say, honestly, that Java streams are the ones uh, that really got me excited about Java in the first place. And, and before Java 8, I was one of those people complaining constantly that Java sucks. And for me to actually praise Java, I think the entire merit to that uh, goes to Java streams. And, and I remember very clearly, this was about maybe three years before Java 8 was released, I was sitting at my desk one morning trying to look at Java 8, uh, telling myself there's nothing exciting here. I've used uh, lambdas in several other languages before. What's the big deal? Why should I care about what Java is doing? And I looked at lambdas and I said to myself, OK, great, Java has lambdas. Big deal. I'm not excited yet. And I remember just you know, walking through uh, you know, examples on the API and, and playing with it. And I literally remember standing up in my, uh, you know, on my, uh, at my desk and, and saying, whoa, this is awesome. And, and that really, that awesomeness was in Java 8 streams for me. And the reason I was excited about Java 8 streams is that Java did not simply say, hey, we're going to bring you lambdas and, and, and we're going to provide what everybody else is doing. Uh, Java made a really big difference in implementing streams in a certain way, which is the lazy evaluations. And, and to me, that's what really got me excited about Java 8 streams. In fact, uh, you know, about three years before Java 8 was released, um, if you had take, uh, taken a look at the Java API, you would have found methods like filter and map on the list directly and on the set. So you could have said a long time ago, you could have written code like, for example, list.filter, for example, or you could have written list.map. And I remember waking up one morning and looking at the API, and all of a sudden they were gone, and I was a little agitated. It's like, where did all this API go that they've been really developing for this time? And I was surprised at that point that what they did was they decided to move all those methods into the stream. And of course, the filter and the map, as we know right now, is residing in the stream. The list at that time also had a for each method. And we know that right now the for each method is on the stream, but these two have gone away. And so it got, you know, got me thinking, why don't those methods exist on a list? Why do those methods really exist on a stream? And there is a really uh, a very calculated uh, reason for it. And, and the reason for that is there is not just a syntactical difference moving into Java 8. There is a very huge semantical difference as well, which is the lazy evaluation. So the designers of the Java API, for the stream API that is, wanted us to clearly know that when we are calling a for each method, we might be executing that method 
pretty immediately or eagerly if you want to think about it that way. On the other hand, if you're executing filter and map and other operations, those operations may not execute right now. That may happen at a later time, the lazy valuation. And so semantically, they want us to know that if you did list.stream, Immediately in your mind, you need to know, aha, uh -huh, this is no longer the same old story. This is a very different semantics we are dealing with. It's potentially a lazy evaluation rather than being an eager evaluation. And that semantical difference is extremely important. This is one of the things I really care about a lot is one of the things a lot of designers really want to do is that they want to make APIs really seamless. And I would actually beg to differ from that. I don't want it to be so seamless that programmers fall into a trap and don't realize they are dealing with something completely different semantically. And I would say Java 8 struck the really right balance. It's almost seamless, but you can still see the seam just a little bit. And to me, that seam is the call to the stream. It tells you in your mind that, hey, you no longer are dealing with eager valuation. You are switching over to lazy valuation. And that little seam is extremely important given all that uh, we are looking at. Now, having said that, what is it really that excites me about Java 8 Stream? And uh, let's talk about that a little bit in here. Well, of course, this was introduced in Java 8, of course. And in Java 8, of course, before Java 8, what we did in Java was predominantly an imperative style of programming. So what was Java in the past? I would say imperative uh, plus object oriented. We, we actually never really did full object oriented programming in Java. We, we, uh, we always did imperative style of programming along with object oriented style of programming in Java. So what that really meant was we had to really wade through all this complexity complexity of imperative style of programming that we are so used to. So how does it really feel like if you really want to think about it this way? So let's say for a minute that I want to take a collection of numbers, I want to work with it. And what I want to do is to find the double, let's say, of uh, even numbers and, and create a collection of double of even numbers. So what's the very first thing we're going to do for that? Well, the first thing is we're going to say a list of integer, if you will, and we're going to call this as doubled, if you, if you want to call it as doubled. And I'm going to say doubled is equal to new uh, array list and you're going to create an object of array list and empty array list to begin with. That's the very first sign of trouble, right? We have to really create this empty collection to work with. I'm going to print the double when we are done with it, of course, in the very end of this. But between these two, of course, I want to loop through and look for the values. So I'm going to say for int i equal to 0, i less than, and of course, I'm going to ask for numbers.size over here. But if you really think about this, this is a really good example of a very complex code. Now, of course, when people look at this, they would say, what do you mean it's complex code? It's a simple for loop. Well, the word simple is very confusing. We often get confused with this word simple. What we really mean is not a simple for loop. What we mean is a familiar for loop. Well, a familiar for loop, because we have looked at it so many times that it's very familiar to us, but it's really far from being anything really being simple. So what do we then do? Then we say if numbers dot uh, get of the element i, and then you ask for a mod of 2, and you say, if this is even, of course, then I want to take the double, and I want to add to it the numbers dot get, and of course, I want to double the value and store into it. Now, this is an example of the imperative style of coding, and you can see the result of 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20 being uh, returned to us. But if you look at this code, that's a lot of effort to write this piece of code. Now, this reminds me of a really wonderful saying by Michael Feathers, and this inspires, you know, things like this can be very inspiring to rethink about what we do. And so Michael Feathers uh, uh, talked about this, and, and so what is uh, he saying? So he says, I'm paraphrasing the words a little bit here, but, but his, um, his statement was that he said uh, in uh, object-oriented programming, we encapsulate uh, the moving parts. So, uh, and then in functional programming, we eliminate the moving parts. So this is a really nice way to uh, think about it if you think about what we are really trying to do. In, in object rendered programming, we try to encapsulate the moving parts. So one of the things that causes a lot of trouble for us in general in programming is, is mutability and moving parts. And the more moving parts we have in the code, the more difficult it is to really reason with the code 
code and to implement the code and maintain it and bugs creep in as well. Well, in functional programming, we try to eliminate the moving parts. Well, to me, there are two things that really cause moving parts. One moving part is, of course, the moving part of uh, mutability, but the other moving part is where we are constantly sifting through the logic in the code and, and the control flow is another moving part in, in, in this case. So if you typically look at an imperative style of code, what does an imperative style of code look like? So the imperative style simply is equal to uh, tell me what and also uh, tell me how. So you have to focus on both aspects when it comes to imperative style of programming. You have to tell me what and also you have to tell me how to do it as well. And, and that is a lot of burden we have to carry with us as programmers. That's a lot of effort we have to put in. So in this case, if you really think about it, what did we do? We first have to define an empty collection. Then we had to loop through every single value. We had to check if the value is even. And then, of course, then get the value, double it, and then go to the collection and add it, and that's mutability again. And if, of course, in this case, in, in a typical code, you would have a break and continue, and you have to go back and forth with all this logic in your code, that's a lot of effort for you to write. Now, on the other hand, we can write the code in a functional style of programming. And so how does it really feel like to do the same thing in the functional style? So I'm going to go back here and say that given the numbers that we start with, I'm going to get a stream out of it. I'm going to say filter. And given an element, I'm going to say element mod 2 is equal to 0. And then I'm going to perform a map operation. And in this case, given an element, element times 2. And then, of course, I can simply say collect. And in this case, of course, when I collect it, I want to simply put it into the collection I want to create. So in this case, I'll simply say joining, and I will call the joining methods to join the elements. Or in this case, we can say to list because all I want to do is uh, put it into a list. So I'm going to say a to list and ask it to drop it into the list. But when I run the code this time, though, notice the result is exactly the same. But the difference is quite significant when it comes to the code we are creating. So what did we do in the functional style? Well, before we talk about functional style, well, in Java now, we can do something a little different. We can do imperative plus functional uh, plus object oriented. So this really gives us a, a better set of tools on our hand. So rather than being forced to do imperative plus object oriented in Java today, we can do imperative uh, uh, today plus imperative plus functional plus object oriented. So this functional aspect is pretty intriguing. But before we really go into functional, we have to really think about something else that's pretty significant, and that is declarative. So what is declarative? Well, tell me what, uh, uh, what, and of course not a how. So you are able to focus on telling what you are doing rather than trying to tell you know, how to really do it. One of the things that excite me a lot about these technologies is they're not completely in isolation of each other. They build on each other really nicely. So I'm going to talk about what it means to uh, you know, do functional for me, in my mind at least. So I'm going to say functional really is equivalent to declarative plus the use of higher order functions. So this is really what uh, a functional programming to me is that it is actually built on the declarative style. So functional programming is declarative first and then plus the use of higher order functions to build on top of it. So one of the reasons why functional programming is really exciting is because it's declarative in nature so we can focus on what we are doing rather than being dragged into how we do things. That becomes really exciting. So if you look at this code right here, one of the key things about declarative style uh, declarative and functional, of course, uh, and, and that is we can uh, go home telling the code reads like the problem statement. So this is a very huge benefit when it comes to the declarative and functional style of programming. I have a little exercise for you. Um, take this code and, and, and put it in front of a programmer and ask him to read the code and tell what the code is doing. 
but then sit in front of them and watch their eyeball movement. And it's a lot of fun to watch this. And their eyeball will move like this. It'll start in the for loop. It'll come down and go up and come down and go up. And then it'll do this. That's called the point of confusion. They're not sure what the code is doing. But if you look at the code in the bottom, one of the beautiful things about it is a single pass through. So if you look at this code, you, you, you can see their eyeball movement going from the top to the bottom in one sequence. Given a collection of numbers, get me all the even numbers, double them, and put them to a list, and notice how it flows through in a logical order. I was visiting a client, and they asked me, hey, would you look at our code and critique it? And usually I get nervous when people say it, because you don't want to say nasty things about a client's code on the first day at work. And, and, I, and I, looked, I said, okay, I'll try to do it. And they show me the code, and they've written the code in Java 8, and I don't know anything about what they do at that point, because it was the first hour at work. And I was just reading the code, you know, mouthing the code, and as I was reading it, I'm actually able to make sense of what the code is doing. And even I could understand what the code was doing, having no context about what their code is doing in the, in the, in the beginning. And that is one of the biggest benefits you get out of that is it removes that impedance mismatch. It becomes really easy to understand through a single pass through through this code. That's one of the biggest benefits. Well, this really brings us to the internal iterators. Now, internal iterators really are, th this, if you look at it, this is an external iterator. An external iterator is where you are managing the entire iteration all by yourselves. So external iteration, uh, ver uh, iteration versus, uh, we're going to say, internal iteration. So one of the biggest benefits of this approach is the internal iterators. So what is an internal iterator? Internal iterator is where the iteration is on autopilot. You simply say, do this, and the iteration is taken care, so you can focus on what to do per element rather than asking how to actually perform this particular operation. So this is one of the biggest benefits is the internal iterator, but the internal iterator comes through the use of streams for us. So when I look at stream, I always think of it as an internal iterator because that's what it really does for us. But of course, the, one of the biggest benefits is reduced complexity of code. I'm going to say that imperative style is inherently uh, complex. So um, if you really think about the imperative style code, you have to deal with a lot more complexity that is baked into the imperative style of programming. The functional style removes that complexity quite a bit. Now, having said this, of course, you are interested in the functional style, the, 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 the streams API, but isn't just that, that it's a different form of iteration, or are we really done with it then? Well, it turns out there's actually a lot more about it. Now, if you really think about it, some things are uh, predictively irrational, and this just surprises me quite a bit. Now, let's step back for a minute and think about it. What are the lessons we have learned in the, in the, in the past several years? One thing we know is about mutability, right? So what do we know about mutability? Well, mutability is what we do quite often in programming in languages like Java and in other languages that are imperatively style and object-oriented. But we know one thing about mutability, though. And that is shared mutability is purely evil, right? And, and we know this quite a bit because if you do shared mutability, it becomes unbelievably complex to maintain the code. So mutability may be OK, but shared mutability is devil's work. And the minute you bring in shared mutability, it becomes absolutely difficult. But, but let's think about this for a minute. Now, let's go back to the very old API of Java for a minute, and we're going to say new thread over here. Now, what does this thread do? It creates a thread of execution, and the thread of execution runs off to do stuff. This is like, yeah, this is awesome. So I'm going to say thread is equal to new thread, and I can say thread.start over here. Now, of course, this calling thread is going to run to do whatever it's going to do. This other thread of execution is running over there. Now, how do we say something has to run in this other thread of execution? Now, of course, today we live in the world of thread pools, but entertain this thought for just a little bit. So what am I going to do here? New runnable. OK, great, runnable. Now, think about this for a minute. What is the most famous method in Java, the runnable, of course, has a method called run, 
Now just stare at this method for a minute for me. If you stare at this method, what does this method really tell us? It says, I won't take anything from you and I won't give you anything. How rude. If you really think about it, right? So this is like some people at work, isn't it? You can't talk to them and they won't talk to you back, but somehow you have to work with them. Now this code says, I won't take anything from you and I will not give you anything back. So what is written all over this? Mute, well, sorry, not mutable. Shared mutable, isn't it? Because the only way you can do anything useful with a method that takes no parameters and returns nothing is to import shared mutability. Now, think about this. This is predictively irrational, isn't it? Because how could you possibly work with the threading API when shared mutability is dangerous to work with a method that forces shared mutability on you. So this is dead on arrival, if you really think about it, isn't it? So this is written all over, and in fact, they could have boldly called this as disaster, right? Because that would have been a better name for it because that's what it is saying, bring it on and we'll cause trouble for you. So the whole concern here is how do we really communicate with this? Now think about this for a minute. You are at work and you have written a code and you have taken all the effort to write this code and everything seems to be working and on that fateful morning somebody comes to you and says, hey, let's go ahead and take a look at improving the speed performance of this code. And you've been scratching your head trying to make this code performant and you're not sure exactly how to improve performance and somebody comes to you and says, I've got a great idea. And now you're a little bit more worried. And you're like, what's your great idea? And they say, well, we can improve performance by using multi-threading. And when you hear this, what does your mind do? It throws immediately fit, isn't it? Because it, you immediately remember about the past job you had. And how was the job, the job you had? The code was all sequential, the code was simple, the code was easy to maintain, and everybody went to lunch together, they smiled at each other, and you had a good time at work. And then on that job, one day, you decided to use multi-threading. And when you used multi-threading, what happened? The code turned into a monster. There was locks and synchronized every corner you turned, and you could never recognize the code you once had. And you look at this and say, I can see something like this in the past, but all this fluff around it. And that's horrible to maintain, isn't it? And then what did you do? As you were trying to really make this code work, there were so many bugs. People didn't go to lunch together anymore. They don't smile with each other. And then you work late in the night. And one night late in the night, 2 a.m., as you're still trying to debug, you apply to this other job. That's called concurrency, isn't it? And you're like, never mind, I don't want to do this anymore. Now, this is one of the things that really uh, you know, caught my attention is that in the past, uh, well, the, the structure of sequential code, so sequential code was very different uh, from the structure of concurrent code. So this is one of the uh, biggest challenges we fought in the past. This is before Java 8. The structure, uh, structure of concurrent sequential code was very different from the structure of concurrent code. On the other hand, what did Java 8 streams do? Now, look at this code in the top. If you have written this code and somebody comes to you and says, make that code run faster, the right response is laughing, isn't it? Because you thought they were joking. Because nobody would survive the journey so easily. So you're not like, never mind, I'm not gonna do that. But on the other, on the other hand, if you want to parallelize this, the effort is almost trivial because you can simply turn this from a stream to a parallel stream and you can execute that code in parallel without having to really do as much work. And that is one of the biggest benefits of this particular stream API is that it's really easy to turn that around if you want to. So what did we really gain from this? So I'm going to say with streams uh, for a change, the structure of, if you look at this code, the structure of uh, sequential code uh, is the same uh, as, the, as the structure uh, of 
concurrent code. So this is a huge benefit. So with streams, the structure of sequential code is the same as the structure of concurrent code, and as a result, it's easy to reason the code. It's easy to develop the code, and if you don't need the performance yet, you can keep the code sequential. When you need the performance, you can convert the code into something a little bit uh, better in, in terms of execution without having to completely rewrite the code. So oftentimes people ask me, is Stream API slow? And on my answer to that question is really simple. When it comes to slow versus speed, uh, asking a sequential code, uh, imperative code rather, asking an imperative code to be uh, made uh, faster uh, in terms of you know, taking the sequential code and making it faster is like saying, hey, uh, I want a faster bicycle. No, I don't want a faster bicycle, I want a rocket. So the point really is, if really speed matters, I don't want to take a imperative code and make it faster by making it, a, a sequential code and make it faster by making it imperative. I would rather take a functional code and make it parallel to get the performance out of it. So the real concern here is not the speed between these two versions of the code. Which one is easier to really parallelize is the question that I would really go after. So as a result, the Streams API is absolutely phenomenal from that point of view. Now, of course, the code is quite powerful series of transformations. So this is one of the things to consider here. If you look at this code, one of the questions I would always ask is, you know, what, what is functional programming? And, and of course, I gave one definition earlier, and I said functional is equal to declarative plus higher order. Uh, functions, but I want to go a little bit uh, deeper here. Well, to me, a lot of times when people talk about functional style, they talk about immutability, and they talk about uh, uh, higher-order functions. But I'm not a fan of these because when I looked at functional programming, I struggled with this because I said, what could it be to just say it's immutable, especially when that's the hard part of writing code, and, and telling developers that code has to be immutable is like telling children that they have to eat vegetables. No doubt they don't like doing it. So the question to ask is, what is the benefit of those things? I'm going to say these are not the end. These are just means to an end. So what is the real means we are looking at? So to me, functional programming really contains uh, two parts. The first and foremost to me is that it engages into a functional composition. And to me, this is one of the biggest benefits of functional programming is the functional composition. So if I go back to this code, notice how we have a nice series of composition of these functions. It's a pipeline of functions. If you Google for this, you will find it. Uh, Martin Fowler uh, wrote a, a beautiful uh, blog post called, he, uh, uh, he calls it as the collection pipeline pattern. So if you Google for it, you'll find it collection uh, pipeline a pipeline pattern. So uh, in this case, of course, he, he calls this as a collection pipeline because if you really think about it, it's a collection of pipeline of functions that you are really dealing with. And that is one of the things to really think about, about Stream's API. And, and this is something we need to really carry home. Stream is not a data structure, right? So what is it then? It is an abstraction uh, of functions. That's what it really is. It's a stream of function pipeline, not a data pipeline. So if you really think about it, think of the word bucket, if you will. A bucket is what you use to maybe hold water or some liquid uh, versus a pipeline. And, and a pipeline, you don't store water in a pipeline, you move liquid through a pipeline. So a list and a set is like a bucket uh, versus a stream is more of a pipeline. It's a collection of functions that through, through which you're going to pass the data. It's not a data structure. This is one of the biggest distinctions to keep in mind is the function composition aspect of functional programming is extremely critical.
The other aspect that is absolutely phenomenal here is to really understand about the laziness or the lazy evaluation. So if you go back to this code for a second, let's go ahead and say, remove this and say check E just for a minute. And I'm gonna write this method check where the check method is going to tell us whether, let's actually name this as E's even, so it's a little easier to see. So let's write this as E's even. What is the E's even method going to do? So I'm gonna say public static, let's go ahead and say in this case, a Boolean, and I'm gonna say E's even. And, and this is going to take a number and simply return a number mod two is equal to zero. But in this case, when I go back and execute this code right in here, you can see that it's still executing and producing the result, but I'm going to go ahead and say output called for, and let's simply put the value n over here. So when I run this, you can see several calls to call for, for each of those values in the collection. But if I were to stop over here, Let's go ahead and remove this for a second and, and, and simply put a semicolon here, execute the code. You can see that it's still running all those called methods. But if I were to stop shy of the terminal method, and if I were to stop right in here and execute the code, you will notice that it actually did not call any of those methods. And that's because it really says, if you're not gonna use the result, why bother wasting the time and effort running it? And that is one of the biggest benefits is, I'm gonna say functional programming is function composition plus lazy evaluation. So if you don't provide laziness in evaluation, I don't think there is much point in celebrating functional programming. Several languages give you functional composition. Uh, Ruby, for example, Python, JavaScript, Groovy, and you can keep listing several languages. But those languages give you the functional style, but they don't give you the laziness of the evaluation. And, and the laziness really comes from the implementation of stream and, and remove laziness I don't think we're gonna be in this room today talking about this because it's not gonna be exciting because performance will not be really uh, good, especially when you're dealing with large a collection of data or big data. So laziness to me is absolutely critical. Those are some of the reasons to really uh, focus on it. Well, that's great so far. So the key features are functional pipeline or function composition and the lazy evaluation. But having said this, absolutely, I'm thrilled about Java 8 streams, but there are some significant limitations when it comes to Java 8 streams. One of the very first limitations is it's a single use only. So what does that really mean, single use only? Let's go back to this code for a second. Let's go ahead and say we have a stream we have created right here. And I'm going to go ahead and call the collect method on the stream. And I'm going to execute this particular stream uh, of execution. But what I'll do here is I'll say stream of integer, and I'll go ahead and save this as stream is equal to numbers.stream, and I'm gonna store that into a variable. And, and once I store it, I'm gonna simply say over here, a stream dot, and I'm gonna call through here, and I'm going to simply output this result of this for now. And of course, when we go back and execute this code right in here, we are going to get the collection of data, all of them, of course, doubled as we would expect it to work. So executing this code, you can see all that value being displayed. I'll get rid of the uh, message here so we can see a concise output right now. So you can see that work. But on the other hand, though, if I'm not careful, and if I were to re-execute this on the stream, and if I were to say, oh, maybe I'm interested in all the values greater than you know six, and I'm gonna change the filter maybe, but it's the same stream I wanna work on, and, and unfortunately, that doesn't go really well. So stream has already been operated upon are closed and we're not able to do it. So I know what I'm gonna say is a little gross, so I apologize for it, but I like saying gross things because it makes us remember this for a long time. So I'm gonna say stream is like Q-tips, right? Um, so don't use them and reuse them. So you use it once and you throw it away. So this is a nice way to really help programmers remember you should never use uh, you know, streams. Streams are like Q-tips.
tips. Don't reuse them. Use it once and throw it away. Never share it with anybody else, of course. That's also important. So the point really is that you can only use it once. It's not something you can reuse it. And that is something you have to keep in mind. That uh, That's a limitation of a stream. You cannot reuse a stream. You can just use it once. Uh, so it's like uh, Q-tips, uh, just use it once, right? So that's all you can do. You cannot reuse it. That's one of the limitations of streams. The next limitation, unfortunately, is that it's a single pipeline. So what I mean by that is, what if I've drawn a pipeline right in here, but right in the middle of the pipeline, I want to fork it. So I want to take this pipeline that I have, but I want to send it across two different directions. So yes, it's a single pipeline, but I want it to fork and go this way with the series of filters and map, and this way with another series of filter and map. I can't do it. So you cannot really uh, fork in the middle of stream and say, I want the data to flow in two different directions. That's not possible. So in other words, you, a, a different way to think about it is a, a, a single, uh, well, you can say a single terminal uh, operation, right? So that's all you can have, a single terminal operation, a single flow through the pipeline. You cannot really fork it right in the middle. Now, the last thing I want to ask the question is, how do you deal with exceptions? That's a very important question to ask because we need to really understand how to deal with exceptions when it comes to uh, Java 8 streams. And I can answer that question in two English words, if you will. And those two English words are good luck. And essentially, there is really no good way to handle this. In all honesty, anytime somebody asks me, how do you deal with exceptions, my uh, uh, answer is sorry. So that's the best answer I can give. And the reason is, there is a reason why we need to really keep in mind why this is the case. And the reason for that is, uh, exceptions are imperative uh, style uh, ideas. So in, if you really think about exception handling, so what does exception handling do? In exception handling, you are calling a function which calls another function which calls another function. You run into some difficulty right here, and what does it do? It blows up your call stack, and you go all the way to the caller or wherever the uh, try catch is sitting, and that's where you're going to go land in the catch block. Now, think about this for a minute. You're driving on the freeway, and, and into the seventh kilometer of your drive, you, are, you had a flat tire. And you call a friend of yours and say, I'm driving on the freeway. I have a flat tire. What do I do? And your buddy says, oh, it's very easy. Blow up the freeway and go to where you came from. That is stupid, isn't it? That's not what you will tell people. You would tell them, well, you got a blown tire. Exit safely and pull over to the shoulder and get out. Well, in other words, you are not going to blow up the freeway. You're not going to go back where you came from in this journey. Instead, you're going to get out of the freeway safely, and that's exactly what you want to do. Unfortunately, Java 8 Stream doesn't have anything for that. If you're looking at a language like Haskell or Scala, well, they talk about what are called maybe monads. And essentially, in the case of Scala, they have an object called either. And what does the either do? It's got a left part and a right part. The right part contains the data. The left part contains, of course, the exception that you have. And then you propagate that down the stream. And in every stage of a pipeline, you check if the if there's a right part or the left part, if there's a right part, you do the transformation. If it's a left part, you just pass it through. But that, to me, is a burden you have to carry through every single stage. And, and what is the, the part that bothers me the most is this approach totally lacks cohesion. And as a result, it's not a very elegant piece of code to write in functional programming. And, and so as a result, I think the answer that summarizes this really well is still the word good luck because there's really no good way. And part of the reason for that is in the functional programming, we want functions to be pure functions. And pure functions are doing operations. And normally, exceptions come from impurity operations. 
Even though you could argue that you could have exceptions in pure operations, they are far and few, and you can structure them around this. So this is one of the biggest uh, you know, drawbacks, if you will, of the stream, a stream API, is there is no real elegant way to really do this. So let's leave this thought aside. We talked about what's good about streams, what is really the limitations of streams, and, and, and I love streams. Oh, one other thing, streams, of course, are limited to one JVM. That's where we are really using streams. Streams API in Java 8. So let's leave those thoughts aside. We'll come back and compare and contrast streams with the reactive streams a little later on. Now let's switch gears and talk about reactive programming. So what in the world is reactive programming? Now, this is one of the things that really I struggled with. When I started hearing the word reactive programming, I was very curious, like everybody else uh, is curious, and I really wanted to know what is really reactive programming. And, and the more I read, honestly, the more confused I got. And I was really getting frustrated because uh, I wanted to really relate it to something that I already know about. And I was struggling really hard, and it took me a while to come up with a realization of what reactive programming really is, and, and that's what I'm going to focus on in, for the next several minutes is uh, talk about what I think reactive programming is, at least in the way that I want to see what it really means. So reactive programming is an idea that was formulated by uh, Eric Meyer as he worked in Microsoft Research. So this actually came out of Microsoft Research, but to be fair, while that's an idea out of Microsoft Research, the idea is not entirely new. It's actually a nice, beautiful, and essential reformulation of ideas that have been around for a long time. You could argue reactive programming has been around for a very long time. I finally realized that we work in a field where every 10 years, we'll give a new name for what we already do and get really excited about it. And, and so this is an idea that's been around for a while, but it sounds a lot nicer to say reactive programming. But what is really reactive programming? Well, reactive programming simply says that the applications we develop, the programs we create, must be really responsive and be able to react to stimuli in a system. Now, why is that really critical? Part of the reason for that is that applications we are developing today. Now, think about what just happened in the past, maybe 10 to 15 years, depending on where you live, and and, and what you are interacting with. Uh, there, some of you may not even remember this, or some of you may not even know this, depending on how old you are, but others may remember the time. You actually used to walk into this building called the bank. And, and some of you may remember this. You walk into a bank, and, and there was a human called Teller. And you would talk to this person, and you would exchange pleasantries, you would talk about how the weather is, and then you perform the financial transaction. Some of you may remember walking into a travel agency to book a ticket to travel. And, and these days are gone. Now, what happened in the past 10 years was, well, in the past, companies made products for their employees to use and made those employees available to us, the customers. When employees use a product, those employees have a special name. They're called captive users, meaning nobody cares what they think. And they can complain but they just have to go back to work and use the silly product that's been developed. Well, now companies build products for real-world users to use. It doesn't matter what the size of your company is. I'm going to assume you have more people users than employees. So the magnitude of scale is enormous. And we are living in the age of big data right now. We are talking about wearable devices, IoT. I'm not talking about you know, uh, watches. I'm talking about e Earrings, nose strings, and tongue rings all internet enabled and constantly transmitting data. We're not far from the days when your doctor's office may call you and say, hey, we're noticing your blood pressure is increasing. You may want to sit down. And, and you can say, no, no, I'm fine. I'm just listening to this guy, guy called Venkat. And, and the point really is that you can just sit there and be monitored. I don't know if that's good or bad, uh, but, but, but that's where we are heading, unfortunately. And as a result, we are looking at a 
large volume of data being transmitted. So as a result, we are looking at applications that are very different in terms of the behavior than only 10 years ago or 15 years ago. We are talking about flights today. You know, I really don't like the words uh, flight recorder because a lot of times we hear the word flight recorder, unfortunately, when a, when a flight uh, airplane goes down. But today we are talking about systems that are constantly monitoring uh, flights and getting data from the flights. The other day, somebody was telling me that every second uh, a flight in motion uh, transmits 1.5 terabytes of data. Can you imagine 1.5 terabytes of data every second? I took a 16-hour flight uh, a few weeks ago. You can imagine uh, every second for 16 hours or more, uh, 1.5 terabytes of data being transmitted. The point I'm getting to is, when you're getting 1.5 terabytes of data every second, there is no tomorrow. There is no, let me come back and process this data later on. Sorry, there's no later on. Either do it now or you do it never. So we are talking about really systems where we can talk to data live, and I will tie this back into data flow just a little bit later, so we'll come back to that. So that brings up the question, what does it really mean to develop these kinds of applications? Well, this is one of the things that Reactive Manifesto talks about, is the four pillars of the reactive programming uh, model and the reactive programming, uh, reactive systems and applications. Before I talk about it, let's talk about, uh, you know, something related to something we already know about, and, and that is uh, object-oriented programming. Well, object-oriented programming contains four pillars of its paradigm, isn't it? So what's the first pillar of OOP? The first pillar of OOP is abstraction. Now, one of the reasons I mentioned this is everyone knows abstraction is not new to object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming has used abstraction, but humans have used abstraction for centuries before that. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Plato has talked about abstraction and a picture of an apple different from a real apple, for example. The second thing is encapsulation. So encapsulation, again, is nothing new to object-oriented programming because encapsulation simply is data hiding We've always encapsulated variables. Local variables are encapsulated even before OOP. Nothing new, really. Encapsulation is simply one of the most important features in OOP. The next thing here is inheritance. The only inheritance I can think of is inheriting pain. This is one of the worst features of OOP. And a lot of people think this is important, but this is the weakest link in all of that. But the most important feature of object programming to me is polymorphism. So what does polymorphism say? It says that you don't worry about the reference you have at hand. Go ahead and call the method, and we will call the right method based on the true type of the object at runtime, not the perceived type of the object at compile time. So polymorphism gives you extensibility of code, and those are the four pillars of object-oriented object programming. Similarly, reactive programming also has these four uh, pillars, and the very first thing it emphasizes is elasticity. So it's elastic. Now, in current terms of, you know, you could say it's reactive applications, it's reactive systems that we are building. So to me, I consider these as formulation of the programming model because what good is uh, your concepts if you cannot program them or, or build them? Well, elasticity is extremely important. Now, we, this is one thing I would say we have done really well in the past about 12 years. Uh, some of you may remember the time we first heard about cloud computing. Now it's a foregone conclusion to put things on the cloud. Now, what is really beneficial about this is things can be on the cloud and it can scale really well. I was talking to a client of mine and, and they deal with 70 million users within a short period, a time of 72 hours every month. How do you go from nobody cares about your systems most of the time to scaling up to 72 million users very quickly? 
Uh, I work with another uh, 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 big data project where we have to deal with literally, the last time I checked, in, in one particular use case, we had 5.3 billion computations to execute. How do you scale your system to running 5.3 billion computations? You won't be able to do that without uh, you know, a greater power. So one of the problems really is uh, the, 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 most, the worst question somebody could ask, how many threads uh, can you create? This is a bad question because and, and what is even worse than this question? He is trying to answer that question. And, and the reason is, this is like asking the question, how much food can you eat? That cannot be healthy after all, a good question to ask. Well, the reason is, the wrong answer to this question is, it depends on the memory. No, it doesn't. Because the problem here is really is not the memory constraint. I'm working on a system where I have a client, I love this client, and one day I ask the question, how much memory do we have? And, and their answer is, why this machine has a one terabytes of main memory, but if you need more, we'll get you a bigger machine. I love these people, it's like Christmas every day working for them. And the point really is, it doesn't matter we had one terabytes of main memory, we cannot create all the threads we want if we only have a few cores on the machine. So the question really is, how many threads should I create? And the answer to that is, uh, if you are computation intensive, then it is less than or equal to number of cores. Now, if you are on the other hand, so if you are, if you are task, of course, if your task uh, is computation intensive, so on the other hand, if your task is IO intensive, then the formula is different. So there's a very grim formula for this, and the number of threads is less than or equal to. Notice it's not about or you know, around, it has to be less than or equal to, and it's less than or equal to number of cores on the numerator divided by one minus the blocking factor, where the blocking factor is going to be a value which is between zero, uh, 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 less than or equal to, and then the blocking factor of less than one. So in other words, your number of threads has a huge limitation. Now think about it for a minute. If you are on a machine with a lot of memory, but if you have, uh, 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 let's say, a 256 cores on the machine, you can create up to 256 threads for execution. If you create more than 256 threads, your performance actually goes down. The other day I was at work and we had a machine with about a little bit more than a thousand cores on it. Like I said, I work for a very rich client and they have a very, you know, more than a thousand cores on this machine. And we started running the code sequentially. We want to run it in parallel. So I set the number of uh, 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 threads to run to a little bit over a thousand, depending on the number of cores. We ran the code. The code took about 30 to 40 minutes to run sequentially. And we put 1,000 threads to run on it, and the code finished in about five minutes. And I was celebrating this and saying, look what took about 40 minutes to run, runs in about five minutes, isn't this awesome? And, and the person I was programming with, pairing with said, oh yeah, 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 but before you get so excited, increase the number of threads. I said, no, 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 you don't want to do it. And he said, no, I do want to do it. So I doubled the number of threads. What took 40 minutes to sequentially run, what took five minutes to run parallel, now took 90 minutes to execute. And the point really is the more threads you create, the more it's going to trash and the performance is going to go down. So as a result, you are absolute option here is being elastic. The only way you can scale really is to go horizontal because you cannot put more computations into a box, into a core, into a processor anymore because the number of cores becomes a limitation and you have to scale horizontally. So elasticity is absolutely critical. Well, the second thing to think about is, again, this is not new, but it is message-driven. Now, why is it message-driven? What is the reason for message-driven? Now, we are living this uh, in the world of microservices. Now, when we are talking about microservices, or services in general, what, how do these services interact with each other? 
I was in a meeting the other day when we were talking about implementing microservices. Everybody was happy, everything was going well, and when suddenly one of the developers said, how do all these microservices talk to the central database? The entire room went quiet. It's like somebody died in the room. We were like, you know, really, really upset hearing this because when multiple microservices or services talk to a database, you can change that one central database and you can bring the entire system down, entire infrastructure down. Well, you want isolation. You want uh, aut uh, autonomy of services when it comes to these services. So I have a few slogans that I'm going to really emphasize here. And I'm going to say the very first thing is, uh, this is my personal preference, and I'm, I'm sure your mileage may vary, but I hope you, uh, you would agree with this. So in life, uh, in life uh, and programming, uh, uh, we should never uh, share two things. Uh, one is a uh, toothbrush. So uh, this is one thing I would say, and the second thing is databases. So we should never share these two. You know, occasionally I might even be willing to share my toothbrush, but never a database. So the point really is we should never share these two, and it becomes absolutely critical if we do, because this leads to a lot of other problems we have to deal with. So my slogan really here is uh, do, not, uh, do not expose your database uh, instead, uh, export your data. So, so essentially the idea is uh, don't expose your database, instead export your data. So message driven becomes absolutely critical. Again, message driven is nothing new. We have done this for quite a while, but this becomes absolutely critical part to deal with because we want to constantly exchange uh, information between these services and message driven becomes absolutely critical. The third thing that it emphasizes is that it must be really responsive. So responsiveness is extremely important. Why? Because when you're dealing with services, if a service is taking longer to respond, you're going to walk away. We live in this world of instant gratification. We want responsiveness right away. We're using mobile devices these days, and you click on it, it doesn't respond quickly, you have moved on to checking Twitter messages and Facebook messages, and you're not really sitting on top of that particular application anymore. So responsiveness is extremely critical for us to have. And, and one of the really good examples I can think of for responsiveness is, uh, is, is an example of, if you think about it, responsiveness, uh, think about infinite scrolling. So infinite scrolling is, is probably a really good example of thinking about uh, responsiveness. And, and why is that? Because in, remember this application that was slow and sluggish, but that morning when you went to the app, it was a snap, and you're like, whoa, that's really working nicely. And then you start really scrolling down, and that's when you realize there's no bottom on this page, and before you could react to it, so to say, the page filled up with more data from the server. So this is a nice way to amortize the cost of fetching the data, and if the user doesn't care about some data, why bother really bringing all the data up front? So this gives a nice way for you to postpone this to a later time, but what if we can do that quite a bit moving forward for a lot of things? And the last part of this is uh, resilience. So what is resilience? Resilience really is, so res uh, resilience is really uh, ability for us to uh, you know, uh, be graceful when the failure were to happen. You can never build an application that doesn't fail. Failure is part of what we do. But what if we can handle failure gracefully? So in other words, what if failure is a, fir uh, is a first class uh, citizen? So what if it is, uh, it is okay to fail? What if we will fail gracefully? And what if we will recover from this failure uh, really well? And, and that is one of the key uh, things to build in is, is resilience. Why is this so important? Well, we are living in a very complex world today between your uh, fingertip on your mobile device to a backend server, God knows which part of the world that's located in, there are probably thousands of failure points between that finger that you're gonna click to where the data is located back in the server. And, and those thousand failure points 
Any one of them can fail constantly. And a lot of these failures could be transient. Uh, a lot of these failures could take a long time to recover. So having things like circuit breakers built into it, having the ability to recover from a failure and move forward, uh, providing partial access to an application when other parts are broken, uh, so many other things are very critical from the point of view of scale and reliability and resilience as well. That becomes absolutely critical. So, so this becomes very uh, important to think about. And as a result, these are the uh, four pillars of uh, reactive systems. And, and of course, you, when you're programming, you want to really focus on those as well. But, but like I said, this is nothing new. We have seen this a long time. I'll give you two examples of reactive applications just to relate to why this kind of uh, behavior is very important. Uh, and, 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 and again, nothing really new. We have seen this before. Uh, one example probably of a reactive application, uh, hands down, would be Microsoft Excel. Of course, Microsoft Excel is, you know, has been around for uh, ages. It's nothing new. But if you think about Microsoft Excel, one of the beautiful features of Microsoft Excel is you modify a cell, and before you could blink your eyes, all these cells that depend on it change right away. And recursively, all the cells that depend on those cells change, and this propagates across multiple sheets on your uh, spreadsheets on your application, and that's an example. There's a reason why uh, people uh, 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 use Microsoft Excel to do very complex things, because it's one of the most responsive applications you can think of. Uh, it, is, it is baked into it as responsiveness. One of the other examples I'll mention here is something that I didn't realize until uh, I thought about it a little differently. Um, uh, I, I travel constantly. I live a nomadic life. I'm in random parts of the world almost every, uh, every week. And, and, and that brings up the question, one of the things people often ask me, intrigued is, they ask me, are you still married? Uh, I'm actually pretty happily married. And, and one of the things we do is, we are a digital family, we communicate through electronic documents a lot. I share documents with my family, my children and my wife, Constantly we update these documents. But, but I didn't realize it this way, but one morning I was in a remote part of the world, and I got up early in the morning and I went onto the Google Docs to make some changes that I wanted to uh, communicate with my wife, and when I logged on, I noticed that she was using the document exactly at the same time. And it immediately gave me a thought. I immediately scrolled down the document, and I found the place, exact place where she was editing at that moment. And I was able to put my cursor exactly where her cursor was and start changing the text that she was changing. With this, I found out you could be thousands of miles away and still find a way to annoy your spouse. So to me, <laughs> this is one of the biggest benefits of reactive applications, right? And for her to tell me, get out of my document now was precious. And I was a complete believer in reactive programming right at that moment. And I thought about this and I said, wow, this is amazing. At any given time, think about Google Docs. Literally, millions and millions of people are using Google Docs at any given time. And depending on the organization, depending on the document, potentially uh, a few people to a few hundreds of people collaborate on these documents. And they're able to collaborate live across the world. And to me, that is one of the best examples of a reactive application. There are other applications, of course, like for example, uh, social network applications, maps that are updated by social uh, network, a lot of those things are really good examples of uh, reactive applications as well, because that scale, the magnitude, all of them are absolutely very critical. So that brings up the question, what does it really mean to program uh, reactively? So from that point of view, I want to rethink about what reactive programming really is, and I'm going to uh, say a few things that are from my understanding of what that really means. Well, the very first thing is, if you look back in time, what have we been doing for the past about, oh, 20 years, give or take? I could summarize that as developing a CRUD applications. You create data, you read data, you update data, and you delete data. Now, that's basically what we've been doing for a long time, isn't it? So what do we no normally do? You have a database where the data is sitting. 
You pull the data out of the database, you send it to a function and you process it, and when you're done, what do you do? You put it right back into the database. Now, think about telling what you do to somebody who is not a programmer. I take data from a database and I put it back into it. I mean, what fun is that, right? But that's what we've been doing for a long time. You take the data and you put it back into the database. And at some point, you wake up and ask the question, there's got to be more meaning to life than doing that, isn't it? So, so is it just that we want to be doing card operations over and over? And I'm going to say it turns out that that's not really the case uh, anymore, at least for a lot of things we do. So for example, we take a data and then we pass it to a function. And what happens when you pass it to a function? That function produces, transforms the data. And now we get another data and then all of a sudden, we can think of this as a data transformation rather than data mutation. So what does this really mean? Well, we're looking at a scenario of data flow computing. Now, you could not have survived the 1980s without hearing the word data flow computing. Um, I remember being a young programmer back in the 80s. And you, if you walk down the mall, Constantly, your ears will listen to people chanting data flow, data flow, like they chant Angular and React and JavaScript today. Well, that's on microservices, of course, not to leave that alone. But that's kind of the way it was, that people were fascinated about data flow computing. In fact, organizations were building uh, data flow computers. One of the reasons is, what is data flow? Well, uh, an expression, let's say, put a different name for it, a function, a, a, a can fire, well, let's put a different name for it, execute, and, and what does that mean? Uh, well, it can execute, and when can it execute, if I know how to type that, uh, execute, and when can it execute? Uh, when uh, data it needs uh, is ready. So this is true a concurrency, if you really think about it. Because unlike a von Neumann architecture, you don't sequentially schedule instructions to run. An instruction is ready to execute whenever the data it needs is ready for it to execute. So you can have different instructions. Oh, these instructions are ready to fire because they have the data available. These over here are not ready yet because they are missing one or more data they need. So this was a big deal back in time. So what if I tell you, I've got a great news for you, today you can do data flow computing. Now you're probably gonna look at me and say, Grandpa, sit down, that's not very exciting. But I will tell you those things in a way you'll be absolutely excited. What if I tell you, you can now do Amazon Lambdas and serverless computing. You're like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing I've heard since sliced bread. What I just told you is you can do data flow computing, right? So we just rebranded the whole thing. And so what is Amazon Lambdas? What is really uh, serverless? Well, serverless is nothing but data flow computing of the 80s. Now, really, the reason is, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, an expression is ready to fire when the data is ready for its execution. That's exactly what we are doing today in serverless programming, isn't it? We are saying, look, here is a computation, a function, and the minute it's ready to run, throw it on any random server, that's what is serverless, right? Serverless simply means it doesn't have an affinity of a server to run, it can run on any server. So it turns out we're not dealing with the new technology. So it's kind of foolish to think we're dealing with a different technology. I think we're dealing with something even better. And what is that? Well, when I was a kid, I can only read about data flow computing. I remember reading books on data flow computing, articles on data flow computing, and then I would hold these magazines or books, and I look through the window and say, wow, wouldn't that be so cool to run a program on one of these machines? But no, no, Venkat, you cannot do that. If you work for a privileged organization or you're part of a big university where they built it, you can maybe see it, you can maybe run it. But otherwise, here's a magazine article for you to read. Well, today, my children can use these serverless systems on the cloud for just a few cents. 
They don't need to belong to a big organization. They don't even belong to an organization. They're in school. But they could use these machines. And to me, this is better because what we have seen in the past about 10 to 15 years is something even better than the technology, in my opinion. That is democratization of computing. And I'm absolutely blown away by that because anyone who has the desire to use these systems can access these systems at a very affordable cost. It's true democratization of these technology. That's what we are really seeing uh, in terms of these cloud computing is a rebirth of data flow computing in a much more affordable manner. So given that I'm gonna say, uh, reactive programming really uh, is data flow computing. That's the first thing I wanna say. It's really data flow computing. That's what we are really dealing with. It's a data flow. Well, now that we talk about data flow, what does it really provide for us? So from that point of view, we want to ask the question, you know, how does this really relate to streams versus how does it relate to computing in general? Well, one of the very first things to really think about it is when it comes to these if you think about reactive programming, how are we going to build the code for that kind of programming model? Well, it turns out in reactive programming, we are going to take a, a producer. So we're going to take a producer, and what does a producer do? Producer emits data. So in a way, this is kind of like a stream, isn't it? A producer emits data. Well, then what are we going to do? We're going to subscribe to this and we're going to transform it so you can do a filter operation on it. You can do a map operation on it if you want to transform the data. And then you can do more operations and finally you can subscribe to this data at the very end. Well, given this, I was looking through this and said, well, how do I relate to what I already know? And this was a bit of a realization in my, in my mind. And, and my first realization was reactive programming is a functional programming plus plus. And I say this is functional programming plus plus. And why do I say it as a plus plus? The reason is uh, for two, uh, it builds on a functional composition uh, and lazy evaluation. That's the very first thing. Uh, and takes the abstraction uh, abs abstraction uh, even further. So this is one of the realizations for me is that to think of what reactive programming is. To me, reactive programming is functional programming plus plus. It is built on the same foundations of functional composition and lazy evaluation, and then it takes that abstraction even further so we can sit on top of this model of programming and we can transform the code moving forward. Let's take a look at what that means with a really quick little example just to see how that actually works. We saw a functional pipeline sitting right in here, you saw this, where you did a filter and map and collect. That's just one example. Let's just take one little example and play with it right here. I'm gonna say flowable. We'll talk more about what this means a little bit later. So I'm gonna create an interval right here. And I'm going to say, give me a value uh, every second. So time unit dot seconds. So I'm gonna ask it to give me a value uh, every second. But once it gives me a value every second, I send it through filter. And I'm gonna say, given an element is even element, only give me the even numbers. And I map it, given an element, element times two. And then I subscribe to it and say system dot out and print len and I'm going to print it out right in here so we can see the result of this particular operation. So if I go to this example right here and execute it, well, what does this really do? Well, first of all, let's go ahead and put a little sleep here just to hold the thread alive. So if you look at this particular example here, um, you will notice that in this, in this case, uh, you have a stream of data coming through and when I execute this code, it's going to start emitting the data, which are double F even numbers, as you can see in here. However, if I go back to this code, and if I were to say output uh, called for, and I'm going to say uh, for plus N, uh, and just like the other case, execute the code, and you can see in the output it says call for zero, call for one, and so on. However, if I don't put the terminal operation right in here, just like the Java 8 streams, 
I have the filter and map on this one, but I'm going to stop shy of calling the subscribe, the for each in the case of Java 8 stream, subscribe over here. But when I execute this code, you can see there is no output being produced right there. And the reason for that is this is absolutely lazy. So just like how the Java 8 streams are lazy, our reactive streams are lazy as well. So we can see the functional composition and the laziness of evaluation at the same time. And that is one of the uh, biggest merits is this is not such a, a, you know, a different concept than we may have thought about. And, and once I realized that reactive programming is functional programming plus plus, it gave me a really solid ground to stand on and build on that abstraction. It became a lot more clearer in my mind to use this particular paradigm of programming. So in that sense, you can think of reactive programming as something like extreme programming. Extreme programming did not have anything new. It had 12 principles that were already there, but brought those 12 principles together and said, we should do all these 12 things. In a similar way, reactive programming brings pre-existing ideas together and says, we should really focus on doing these things because these are good to build the modern applications. So from that point of view, I want to talk about some similarities and some differences between Java 8 streams and reactive streams moving forward. So let's draw up this one. We'll say Java streams on the left side, and we're going to put reactive streams uh, on the uh, streams on the uh, uh, right side, and we will uh, write some similarities. Unfortunately, the similarities are far few. And then once we cover the similarities, we'll talk about the differences between them. And, and as we start talking about the similarities and differences, we'll look at some code examples and say, you know, here is how this is going to relate to this particular idea. So we will talk about how, uh, you know, both are uh, really, as we saw, a functional pipeline and lazy evaluation. That part we saw already. We won't look at it again. But then we will start looking at, moving forward, uh, some of the ways that you would do streams API, some of the ways you would do reactive stream API. We'll talk about how exceptions are handled between those two as well. And then we will talk a little bit about uh, uh, one of the key features of reactive streams, which is uh, handling back pressures. Uh, Java 8 streams doesn't deal with back pressures in that sense. So we'll talk about back pressures. And then uh, we will tie this finally into how Java 9 uh, API relates to the Java stream API. So we are about the halfway mark. So we'll take about a 15 minutes break. And then we will resume right from there when we get back. Thank you. All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, let's talk about uh, the comparison between streams and uh, reactive streams. So um, what we're going to talk about is some similarities, first of all. Then we'll talk about some differences along the way. So let's talk about what's similar between Java 8 streams and uh, reactive streams. Well, the very first thing is uh, the Java 8 streams contain uh, a pipeline. We saw this earlier. And uh, it turns out that reactive streams also use a pipeline. Uh, that shouldn't be a surprise. This is one of the reasons why I, I want to make the claim that reactive programming is functional programming plus plus, because it, it appears to be a superset, uh, of functional programming being the subset and reactive programming on the top of that. Um, in the case of Java 8 stream, you have a push of data. And it turns out reactive streams also uh, push data. So it's not a pull. This is one of the biggest differences between streams in general and, and regular iterators. In the case of a regular iterator, we uh, pull the data. On the other hand, uh, 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 streams uh, push the data towards us. Uh, this is why a lot of times you will hear the comparison that reactive streams are like observable, where you register with an observable as an observer, and then that sends you the data when the data is ready for you. So streams are, in a similar way, going to push the data towards you. So, so that's one other similarity between, between the two. Uh, the third uh, uh, similarity between the two is that Java 8 streams are uh, lazy in, in terms of transmitting data. So uh, uh, when they trans in terms of the computations. So when you create a pipeline, 
the pipeline doesn't execute e e e eagerly. It, it waits until a terminal operation is connected and the data is then pushed and it executes at that point. So as a result, it's pretty efficient. Uh, laziness is efficiency. Uh, by having uh, evaluations lazily, you're not wasting computations. And as a result, uh, when you draw up a pipeline, it knows not to really waste its uh, performance running those pieces of code until the data becomes absolutely necessary, and that's the only time it ex actually executes it. Well, it turns out that reactive streams are also uh, absolutely lazy. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, the similarity ends very quickly. And uh, that's basically the common between those two, but there are, immediately you'll start seeing differences emerge very uh, you know, clearly. Uh, the, the next question is, how do we deal with exceptions? And uh, the short answer to that question is, like I said, good luck. You can't do much about it when it comes to uh, Java 8 streams. And also, they deal with data only. And I'm putting these two somewhat together because the answer to these are somewhat connected. So Java 8 streams deal with data only, and when exception happen, it's good luck, right? So what do we do about it? Well, this is exactly where reactive streams differ very nicely. Now, to understand what reactive streams do is reactive streams have what are called uh, three channels. So uh, three channels, in, in that sense, you could argue that, let me actually rewrite it. So data only, on the other hand, reactive streams contain uh, three channels. Uh, so what are the three channels in a reactive stream? Well, the reactive streams contain a first channel, which is the data channel. The second channel that they contain is the error channel. And the third channel they contain is the uh, complete channel. Now, in a way, if you don't mind me doing this, uh, I will detour a little bit and come back uh, as, a, as a slight detour. So reactive streams uh, versus uh, completable future slash promises. Promises are part of JavaScript. Uh, Java's completable futures really are promises. And, and I want to detour a little bit because I, pe developers often ask me this question, and, and I'm sure uh, that's relevant to uh, uh, us here also. So what, is the, what are the similarities and differences between those two? And I will, uh, I will qu spend a little bit of time on this uh, before we go uh, back to the other topic. And, and that is, the first thing is, uh, one, zero, uh, one, are more uh, data from the, in the point of view of reactive streams. On the other hand, if you think about completable futures or promises, you will see that it's zero or one piece of data. This is one of the biggest differences between them. That reminds me there's one more similarity between the two, and that is zero, uh, one, or more uh, data, right? And that's what uh, uh, streams do. And that's what reactive streams do as well. But that's one of the differences between completable futures of promises and reactive streams. Reactive streams are streaming data. You could have zero, one, more, you know, two, three, four, a million pieces of data coming through. Completable futures and promises are zero or one. You don't get any data, you get an error, or you get a data, or you get nothing. So, so that's one of the biggest differences. They both draw up on the pipeline. The reason I wanted to say this was, Promises and completable complete futures have those two channels. So they, they have two channels of communication. So this one is three channels. On the other hand, this one is two channels, right? So this is one of the biggest differences between these two, is that completable futures and promises only have two channels. They don't have the complete channel. Uh, they have the data channel and the error channel, but they only have one piece of data flowing through. On the other hand, reactive streams have three channels of communication that flows through. So anyway, I'll move forward with this. So just wanted to draw that comparison right there. But having said that, let's go back to this one. So you have the data channel, you have the error channel, and you have the complete channel. So these are the three channels of communication. And, and as a result, uh, let's see how this is going to work over here. 
So as an example, let's go back here and say, uh, uh, I'm, I'm using uh, ReactiveX Flowable. I'm using Rx Java here. I'll talk a little bit more about this a little later. So in this case, I'm going to generate uh, data uh, every second. Let's go ahead and say time units. But I'm going to then take this data, and I'm going to filter over here, given an element, give me element which is even. Let's just do this for a second. And then I'm going to do a map and say, given an element, uh, transform the element. I'm going to keep it absolutely silly and simple so we don't have to really do uh, much math in our head, and then uh, given a piece of data, I want to simply output the data. That's all I'm going to do. So, so what does the, uh, uh, the transform method do? So public, let's say in this case, uh, all I'm going to do is a transform uh, takes the data, and all it's going to do is simply return the data. Nothing really uh, useful, right? So all it's going to do is just take the data and then return the data for us. So that's what a transform uh, is going to uh, do for us. So given this, of course, uh, this is going to just emit even numbers over time. So let's go ahead and uh, sleep for about uh, 10 seconds. So then we can just fire this up, sleep function, and uh, fire this up. So every second, it's going to emit data. So this is the data channel that I was talking about. So if I uh, take a look at this one here, you can see the data flowing through uh, every second. Only the even numbers are flowing through. Great. Now that's our data channel. Obviously, as we know, we can use a method reference instead of using a lambda, so that should just work fine. Great, so that's our data channel. But what about errors? What's gonna happen if something goes wrong? Uh, to understand this, um, I will share with you a, a real life uh, experience. Uh, I, I usually give in my talks and classes, I give example from real life into my classes. Uh, this is like nature in reverse. I actually used an example from the class in real life, which was kind of nerve-wracking. Um, so when I talk about reactive streams, I always say, how do you deal with errors? And to answer that question, you know, exceptions, and I'm going to say a good luck over here. That's what we saw. This one is deal with it downstream. So to understand this, let me uh, give you a, a, a scenario of what actually happened. Um, I, I set out last year with, uh, with a mission to speak in uh, 50 user groups around the world within one year of my 50th birthday. Uh, I wish uh, they told me don't do this when I started. It was a pretty uh, tiring experience, but a very wonderful experience. I get to meet so many of the friends around the world. Uh, but once that stop was in Boston, and I had uh, gone to Boston to speak at the user group, and I spoke at the user group late in the night. Uh, it was exciting, so I stayed behind, uh, you know, was talking to the developers. And by the time I got back to my hotel room, it was well past, uh, you know, 11.30 in the night. But I had an early morning flight. It was supposed to be an international flight, but I was going from Boston to Montreal. And I said to myself, Montreal is Canada, which is a neighboring country. Uh, I'm a world traveler. I don't need to go early to the airport. I mean, this is when you know things are going to go wrong. So I said, the flight is at 6.30 in the morning. I'll leave at 4 o'clock. That's plenty of time. So at 4 in the morning, I, I got into my car. And I, it's a rental car. I started driving to the airport. Uh, it had snowed that day, so uh, that night. And so the entire road was filled with snow. And as I was driving, I was alone, thankfully, on the road. And I hear, heard a, a, a loud noise. And the next thing you know, my car is barely moving. So I parked my car, got out of the car, looked at my front wheel. The front uh, right wheel completely busted. Uh, and I was like, uh-oh, what do I do? Looked at the watch. It was 4.15 in the morning. And my flight was uh, taking off at 6.30. And I have a talk to give in the morning when I land there. I have no intention of missing the flight. So I called the towing service. And the towing service was very wonderful, very helpful. It said, Venkat, you are a very valued customer. Uh, we'll be with you shortly. Our estimated time is two and a half hours. I'm like, OK, that's not going to help. I was sitting in the car alone, thinking what I should do. And suddenly, this came to my mind about, I'm not kidding, reactive streams. And I said to myself, Deal with it downstream. And I took a deep breath, turned on the ignition, and put my foot on the gas pedal, and I drove all the way to the airport. And you should have been there when I pulled into the airport, because this is, you know, like, you know, close to five in the morning. It is quiet. And there's this huge noise rolling into the parking lot. And everybody working there, only a few of them, stopped 
And most of them came out to see what's going on. And one person came to me and said, what happened to you? I said, oh, just a flat tire, that's all. Here's the key, by the way. And I quietly walked over to the terminal. Didn't say a word. And uh, about two, three weeks later, I was here in Europe. My wife called and said, hey, remember you told me that you, uh, you know, went all the way to the, uh, you know, this is one of the times you are so happy it's a rental car. So I, I returned the car, and she said, hey, remember you told me about the story? I said, yes. And she said, well, they just sent you a bill. And I said, oh, my goodness, let me sit down before you say it. And then she said, well, they charge you $85. I'm like, I can handle that. So, so now I'm, I've, this is my advice to everybody. Don't worry about flat tires. So uh, I absolutely drove it all the way down. I don't know exactly how the car looked after that, but I didn't have the courage to look at it. But deal with it downstream. This is exactly the point about reactive streams. So reactive streams are built on the idea of uh, circuit breakers. So what does that really mean? So uh, circuit breakers, essentially, the uh, 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 idea behind this is, if you make a function call and your service says, I am not working properly and gives you an error, what is the right thing to do? Well, the right thing to do is to say, look, the service is broken, let's give it some time to heal. But a lot of times, what do we do? We take this and send the error response. When the next request comes in, in good faith, we go back and ping the service. That's called hope, isn't it? But there is no reason to do that, right? So this says, if something went wrong, we're not going to keep transmitting data to you. We're going to give an opportunity for you to heal. It's based on the concept of circuit breakers. So let's take a look at how this is going to work in this example. I know this is a little trivial example, but nevertheless can illustrate the point to us. So notice that I'm going to run this code one more time for us. And when I run this code, you can see it transmits even numbers every, every second it's generating a number, uh, every two seconds we get an even number as an output. Great. Now let's go over here to the transform method. And here we will say if uh, data is equal to, oh, let's say a value of five, then what am I going to do? Throw new uh, runtime exception. Let's throw an exception like we get at uh, production code often. Uh, something went wrong, right? So, uh, so that's going to tell us uh, that something went wrong over there. Now, notice what we are doing here. We are blowing up. But we all can agree that throwing something at other people is not a civil thing to do. I mean, how would you feel if I start throwing this bottle at you right now? You're going to say, what, what, what's wrong with you, Venkat, right? But on the other hand, if something is wrong, as a civilized person, I should give you an error. And you receive it and deal with it. That's such a polite way, nice civilized society. That's exactly what it is. It's going to grab this exception, and it's going to hand it over to you in a very polite way. So right here in this example, this is your data channel. The second one here is your error channel. So you can say error, arrow, output, I'm going to put error all in uppercase, and then plus error. So this is going to be the error channel. So when I go back and execute this code, as you can see, it starts transmitting 0 and 2. But at the same time, when it hits a value of 5, it is going to blow up. Oh, it should have blown up. So 5 times 2 is 10. Well, OK, it probably didn't wait until that point. Uh, so let's go ahead and just give it a little bit more time here. So uh, let's see if I did this right. Data is equal to 5. I'm going to blow up at that particular point, right? So let's actually remove the filter here just for a minute and then fire it up. So when the value is, uh, you know, that value, it should blow up. So essentially, at this point, when it hits the value of 5, it should tell us error. There you go. So you can see something went wrong, and, and it gave us an error, but the value 6 or 7 or later did not show up. And the reason for that is that exception is captured as a data. So this is one of the things to keep in mind is error uh, is uh, just another form of data. So we are going to treat error as a first class citizen. So what if error is just another form of data and we're going to transmit it down the stream? And that is exactly what we are doing here is error is uh, you know, like data, right? So error is like data and you're just transmitting the data to deal with it. And, and of course, it's built on the concept of circuit breaker, so it doesn't transmit any more data when the error uh, happened. Uh, on the same token, though, what if there's not going to be any more data coming through? How do we deal with it? 
Oh, just for the sake of that, let's go ahead and say take, and I'm going to ask it to give me only three pieces of data. And then I'm going to go ahead and say comma, and I'll go ahead and say output over here, done to say I'm done, I'm not going to get any more data. So when I fire this up this time, you can see that it got three pieces of data, and it got a done signal, because we said over here that take only three values. Well, once you finish taking three values, it sends you a complete signal to say, hey, I'm done. I'm not going to get any more data uh, to you. So you can clean up and do whatever cleanup operations you want to perform. So that gives you a nice little signal. So those are the three channels I talked about, the data channel, the error channel, and then, of course, the complete channel or the three channels that are going to get the data for you the error, and a complete signal over to you. So that is one uh, difference between these two, as you can see. While the reactive streams only push data, the, uh, uh, well, the uh, Java 8 streams only push data, reactive streams uh, may push data, error, or complete. Uh, one other thing is, when uh, error is generated, the data channel closes up. There will be no more data coming through. Similarly, when the complete signal is sent, the data channel closes up. There'll be no more data coming through. So this will terminate uh, the minute you have either an error or you have a complete signal. There will be no more data coming through between those uh, through those channels. So that is one of the uh, biggest differences. Uh, moving a little forward now, uh, we are uh, uh, looking at some uh, differences at this point. Uh, let's look at a few other differences. In the case of Java 8 stream, it is sequential versus parallel. So you're talking about sequential and, and parallel execution. Now, uh, you know, earlier I drew a comparison between promises and completable futures and reactive streams. Uh, this is incidentally one similarity between reactive streams and promises and completable futures. Completable futures are asynchronous, streams are sequential and parallel. So in the same uh, uh, way, reactive streams are uh, synchronous versus asynchronous. So uh, async. So AR, you're looking at uh, synchronous versus asynchronous rather than uh, sequential versus parallel computing. So you can set this off to run asynchronously rather than being tied up to parallelism at this point. Uh, this is a very important distinction to keep in mind because, uh, honestly, I'm getting really excited about asynchronous programming moving forward. Uh, in Java, we have been predominantly focusing on sequential versus parallel up to this point. Uh, I'm going to make a bet today. And in the next five to 10 years, we are going to be doing something very different in Java compared to what we do today. We are going to move away from parallelism, in my opinion. And we are going to be branching uh, a lot into asynchronous programming. And uh, it's call it an influence of JavaScript, but it's really not. It's an influence of the world we live in. With all the things like microservices, it makes a lot more sense to do asynchronous programming than parallelism. And I think we are moving in this direction. And, 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 and honestly, I'm very excited for where we are heading in the Java world in terms of asynchronous programming. Uh, they, they've been laying the foundation uh, for these things uh, over the past few years. And into the uh, moving forward, uh, you will hear about a few exciting features coming in Java as well that will uh, you know, move us towards this direction. But, but you can do asynchrony here quite nicely in the case of um, uh, uh, the, the streams here. So what does that really mean in this context? So to understand this, let's take a slightly different example and play with it so we can appreciate this a little bit uh, better. So let's go ahead and create a little example here. So let's go ahead and say uh, flow will dart uh, create but I'm going to go ahead and use a create method. Uh, I'm going to hand toss a little flowable. So I'm going to say emitter, and I'm going to call an emit method and pass the emitter to it. And, and ignore this part for a minute. We'll come back and talk about this a little bit later. So don't worry about it at the moment. So what does the emit method do? The emit method says I'm going to take an emitter, and I'm going to create a little count is equal to 0. And while count is less than 10, I will increment the count real quick, and then I'll say emitter.on next and pass the count. But before I do this, I will go ahead and output right here, let's say emitting, and then I will simply display the count. Before I go forward, uh, uh, let me quickly give a context here. I know this is a really silly example I'm creating. I, I like to create silly examples so we can focus on the concept, but 
It doesn't have to be a silly count which is incrementing. This could be a data coming from a device. This could be a patient record, right? A patient could be monitored. This could be a, a, a particular vitals of a patient. This could be a door that you're monitoring. If somebody left the door open, you want to get a signal. This could be a flight from which you're getting data. This could be a data from a database uh, where you have millions of records to transmit. It could be any data that you're really getting. All you want is, a, is an emitter that's going to emit the data. And on next is the mouth of the data stream. So that is the origin from where it's going to start. So this is emitting data every second. And then when you are done with it, I'm going to say emitter.onComplete. This is where you're sending a complete signal to say, I'm done. I don't have any more data for you. What if something were to go wrong? How do you con con convey an error? Uh, I'll just quickly show here. So if count is equal to five, I could simply say uh, emitter on error, and you can send a throwable uh, right here, right? So you can uh, send a throwable uh, right here as a parameter, so that way you can even transmit an exception uh, through this particular uh, error channel. But we'll just keep up to this for a minute. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to go back here and tie to this and say, uh, a map, given a piece of data, all I'm going to do is simply to show, illustrate, uh, data times two, uh, times one. So this is a no good transformation, just to illustrate the point that you are transmitting and, and transform, emitting the data. OK, that's good so far. What am I going to do next after this? Well, the next step here is to subscribe to this and system.outprintlin. And then, of course, I'm going to tie to this uh, error channel. So error, and I'm going to output the output error. Uh, and then, of course, display the error itself. So we'll go ahead and say plus error. And then finally, we'll go ahead and say, uh, here is the output. We'll simply say done. So this shows us how we can uh, tie these three things together. If I fire this up this time, you can see that it's emitting the data and it's printing the data. That's pretty darn sequential. Well, why is it sequential? An emit, a receive, an emit, a receive, an emit, a receive. That's kind of obvious what just went on here. So that's a sequential transmission of data. But it doesn't have to be sequential. It doesn't have to be synchronous. It could be asynchronous as well. Like how? So notice what I'll do here. I'll go up to this particular transmission, and I'm going to say over here, sleep for about 500 milliseconds. So I'm going to take a nap for about half a second. So when I run this code, notice the transmission rate is about half a second now, right? So half a second delay because your transmission is half a second delay. However, unfortunately, what's going to happen now is I go here, and rather than printing it, I will simply say sample uh, process. So what in the world is process? So public static void, and this is process, takes a integer value, and it outputs the value. So when I run this code, it is going to be half a second interval, but I'm going to output the value and sleep for about a second. Uh, Im imagine this is a, a, a simulating a delay. I'm really you know, trying to figure out the meaning of life when I get this value. So it takes a little bit of computation, some algorithm to be executing. But when I run this code, sadly, even though I'm, I'm transmitting data at a half a second interval, notice I'm blocking that, right, because I'm sequential. Because I'm uh, sy synchronous, rather. Because I'm synchronous, the slowest one is going to dictate the speed at which we are running. Because my processing is slow, the uh, transmission is slowed down. This brings us to a very important rule we have to keep in mind. And the rule is that we want to be non-blocking. So what is the rule, really? The one important rule about this is, as a publisher, you should not force me, the subscriber, to run any faster. You cannot come to me and say, come on, run faster, Venkat. No, I'm going to be as slow as I want to be. You don't want to force me to go faster. Similarly, as a subscriber, I shouldn't come to you, the publisher, and say, slow down a little uh, for me, because I can't process at the rate at which you're sending it. So we should be able to be transmitting and processing at our own pace without having to affect each other. So what are we going to do for that? What I'm going to do here is go to this code and say, observe on a scheduler dot uh, a scheduler's dot. Before we, I won't go too deep into it, but quickly mention one thing. Remember earlier I said there's a formula on how many threads you should really create. If you are a computation intensive, 
the number of threads should be no more than number of cores. If you're an IO intensive, you can create more threads because the formula said number of cores divided by one minus blocking factor, the bigger the blocking factor, the more threads you could potentially have. Well, you could spend your life doing this computation or you can simply say, you know what, I'm a, I, a computation task. Just fire away and create as many threads as the number of cores and they will do that for you. Or you can say, I'm an IO intensive task. So if my threads are busy, fire up a new thread for me. Or you can say, I want to give you my own pool. I want to manage all of this because I like to fail a lot better than you know, using your services you provide, right? This is when you can increase the cost of doing our stuff. Or you create a new thread every time, blah, blah, blah. So you can create any of these. I'm going to just use the computation for now. And, and so what we did here is simply ask it to fire away a, a little uh, asynchronous computation for us and, and to be able to use it, that's what we are saying in this particular case. So, so given this, what, what does that really do for us? Well, the beauty of this approach is, when I fire this up this time though, notice my emitting is still at a half a second interval. My processing is slow at one second interval. And you can see the buffering that worked right there as well. So the transmission was over, but I'm still processing the data, and that's why the emit was over here, but I still process six and then seven, all the way up to 10, and I got the signal for complete after that. So that is uh, a synchronous computation rather than uh, synchronous, if you will. So that is one big difference you can have, synchronous versus asynchronous computations. Uh, while we are at it, uh, we will talk a little bit more about how this actually works. So this is where the back pressure strategy comes in. There is no one, one um, um, shoe that fits all. So let's take a couple of different scenarios for a minute. Imagine I am uh, developing a, a reactive solution for a toll booth. So in my toll booth, there's a camera and that is monitoring all the cars that are zipping by the toll booth. And as a car zips by, my camera captures the license information, transmit to my server, my server looks up who the passenger uh, car is registered to and sends them a bill for the toll booth. Now, everything is going fine. My transmission is happening at the rate at which cars are zipping through uh, on this very fast lane and my servers are processing. But suddenly, there's one request that comes in and my server just choked up. There was a little network delay or some kind of a failure, so what should I do? I know what you are thinking. As a driver, you're thinking, don't worry about the other cars, right? Well, but as a revenue, from the point of view of the company that's you know, using the service, they would want to make sure they bill everybody. So as a result, they chose the buffer strategy. So if their processor is a little slow now, you will buffer up the other car information, when they are bouncing back to the full uh, processing ability, they can process and clear out the buffer. Now, one thing to emphasize, buffering makes sense only when your processing speed is almost you know, in par with the transmission speed. There are times when you're a little slow, but then you will come back up to the surface. If you're gonna be slow all the time, then it doesn't really make any sense, right? Because you're never gonna be uh, able to catch up. Your buffer will overflow, it makes no sense. So wh what do you do if you are always slow? Well, you gotta scale horizontally by putting more processors. So buffering wouldn't make any sense in that regard. What I'm getting to is you can use buffering alone or you can use buffering with uh, elasticity as well and you have to make, that's an architectural design decision you have to make on your product. On the other hand, imagine you are providing a service that is tracking uh, where somebody is. So maybe you are interested in uh, you know, having a social network and uh, you are you know, here at a conference or you are at another uh, event and you wanna know where your buddies are. So you go to this app and it shows where everyone is. Well, that's great. You're just looking at all this dots moving around so you know where to meet and etc. But there's a little glitch. And now, of course, your processor is a little slow and then it's ready to process, the question is, what do you want to see? Well, do you want to see every location they have been through, or do you want to know where they are right now? 
And practically speaking, you don't care about where they have been, you care about where they are now. Because if they have walked away, you would rather immediately tell them to walk towards you rather than saying, let me see where you have been. Oh, darn it, you've gone away from me. So the point really is, in that regard, what you want to do is a drop strategy. So a drop simply means, if I am busy, don't bother keeping around the data because I don't care about it. So if I'm not busy, I will handle the data. If I'm busy, just throw it away because that is not important to me because the latest information you have right now, I will receive and process it. But if I'm busy, just give it to me when I'm not busy. So if I run this code this time though, notice that the output, you can see it is skipping a few values. So it transferred three and four, but notice I did not process three at all. Both three and four were discarded because three and four were generated when I was busy. And then once I process five, I process six, seven and eight were skipped entirely, but I processed nine. So you can see that there are a few values being discarded along the way, and then of course it's done. So that is basically the drop strategy. A third one here is called the latest. Now the latest is just a little variation of a drop. So let's understand what that means. So if your strategy is drop, a data comes up, I send it to you, oh you're busy. So when the data comes up, I keep throwing it away, and then you're like, hey I'm ready. Oh good, I'm glad you're ready. I'll give you the data when I have another one. So there's a period when you may not potentially have anything to do because I don't have a data to give you. On the other hand, latest simply says, hey, here's the data for you. Oh, you're busy. A new data arrives, I keep it. Then another data arrives, I throw this away and I keep it. Another data arrives, so I keep the latest one with me and the minute you are ready, I'm gonna give it to you. So the latest is just a variation of the drop. I'm gonna keep dropping everything except the latest, and then when you're ready, I'm gonna give you the latest. I, I can't run this code to show you any meaningful difference because the difference is so subtle, um, and, and so it wouldn't be meaningful to you know, discuss about the behavior in this particular example, but you get the point. Um, so those are some of the variations of this you can choose depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so, let's keep the buffer for a minute. Uh, similarly, there are a number of other varieties of things you can do as well. Like, for example, debounce. So, th this reactive idea is so prominent that you are seeing this in so many different areas. Uh, one of the things that I'm fascinated about is a language called Elm. Elm is a language, the reason I was fascinated about Elm was, Elm syntax is, 99% Haskell syntax with 1% F-sharp syntax. But it compiles down, like everything else today wants to, into JavaScript. And I was intrigued by it. Haskell is pure, and JavaScript is anything but. And you are able to take this something that's written such purity and run it in this bizarre, right? And, and I was like, wow, this is intriguing because I cannot mutate anything. I, and, and you're developing a UI with no mutability. And I like exploring languages like this because I want to be proven wrong and, and, and several times over. And, and this is one of the fun parts is to rethink your ideas. And you know how everybody says, oh, UI is always mutable. And Elm is like, not really. And you're like, wow, I'm able to use immutability to program the UI, how cool it is. And Elm is touted as a reactive programming language for UI. And it, it changes the way, I, changes the way I think about it. Well, in, in Elm, your keyboard inputs are reactive streams. Your mouse moving is a reactive stream. But imagine for a minute, you are, I'm entering data on the keyboard, and you want to start processing as I'm entering it. Uh, my wife always reminds me, I'm really good at typing the backspaces, meaning I don't know how to type. And, and so if you're trying to take my input and process it, that's a lot of wasted resource because I, I type you process and I hit the backspace and you're like, don't, don't it, remove that, that's the wasted computation. So you may want to really say, okay, Venkat is typing, meaning he's making a mistake, let's wait until he pauses 
Okay, now take the input and, and run it. This is where these kinds of APIs are very powerful. You can do uh, debouncing on it. You can also uh, do a few other ways that you can ask it to uh, you know, take the input, but wait for a frequency of time when there's nothing changing, then start processing it, and you can do quite a number of things. Those things are baked in here, as you can see, a very powerful set of operations you can, you can depend on. So with all this uh, said, you can vary the back pressure and processing rate uh, to a very comfortable level, as you can see in here. Well, that's great. The next difference here is, notice what I said earlier, a single uh, pipeline, right? So you can only have a single pipeline when it comes to a reactive uh, a Java 8 stream. So you cannot do the forking. You cannot say, I want to go up and I want to go down and process two branches. You cannot have two terminal operations in a Java 8 streams. On the other hand, in a reactive stream, you can have multiple subscribers. So you can, you can do this pretty effectively. So multiple subscribers. How do you deal with multiple subscribers? Well, when you deal with multiple subscribers, you have to ask, what do they see, right? What do the subscribers see? And, and, and that answer depends on your problem at hand, what you're trying to do with it. So to understand this, let's take a, a slightly different example and play with it just to give a, 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 get a, a glimpse of how this actually works. So to understand this, let's take a little example here. So what I want to do here is, uh, I want to start with a flowable, if you will. So let's go ahead and say a flowable uh, dot, uh, let's say, integer. Well, actually, let's just do the interval. Let's start emitting data every second. So I'm going to save this away into a feed. So now that it's in a feed, what is my next step? My next step is I'm going to just give a little uh, sleep here for about 10 seconds to just keep the thread alive here. So then uh, let's go ahead and say that I want to uh, go ahead and do one processing. So feed dot subscribe, and I'm going to take the data, and I'm going to send it to process. And in this case, I'll say S1 colon plus data. So let's start with this little example and see how this is going to run. So what does the process do? It takes a message, and all it does is it simply prints the message. Nothing really exciting. So if I run this code, every second you can see it's got one subscriber that is printing the data. Great. But what I want to do, though, is I want to wait for about five seconds. So I wait for about five seconds. Then I say feed.subscribe data. And then what am I going to do here? Process s2 colon, and then I'm going to bring in the data. So now, notice it's the same exact emitter, same exact publisher. But to that publisher, I connected one subscriber but I also connected yet another subscriber. So this subscriber came at time zero. This subscriber came at time five seconds. What are they going to see? There's no right answer. It depends on what you want. How do you want to design it? So in other words, imagine for a minute that you are sitting at home and you're watching a video on YouTube. And this is a very interesting video and you are into the 15th minute of the video. And your friend calls you and says, hey, what are you doing? And you tell her, oh, I'm watching this video on YouTube. And you say what the title of the particular video is. And your friend immediately goes to YouTube, types that title, and says, hey, that looks interesting, and starts watching. You are into the 15th minute of the video. Your friend is in the first minute of the video. You both are watching the same source, so to say, but you're in a time lapse. You are ahead by 15 minutes compared to your friend who came in 15 minutes later. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen in this example. When I fire this up, you can see that S1 came in at time zero, but S2 came five seconds later, but it's got its own view at that point. So you can see where S1 is at five, S2 is at zero. So these are one source, but two subscribers. Here's a way to think about it. Imagine I'm on iMessage, and uh, five seconds later, I am connected with two different people. Maybe I'm talking to my wife on iMessage. 
But I'm also talking to my friend Scott on iMessage. And that's perfectly fine, isn't it? What I'm talking to my wife is none of Scott's business. What I'm talking to Scott is none of my wife's business. So I'm having completely two separate conversations, even though I'm the same person. And this works fine with no problem most of the time. Occasionally, I would type, I love you, and there'll be a very long delay, and Scott says, what the heck, I love you too. And I'm like, oh yeah, I love you, man, but, and it's like, I know you're talking to the wife on the other side. But the point really is that these are absolutely separate conversation, no real conflict between them, no confusion between them, a complete separate subscription. And that's exactly how it works. On the other hand, it is quite possible Maybe you're watching the TV rather than watching something on YouTube. Maybe this is a wonderful football match. You are absolutely drawn into the soccer match and you're watching this and a buddy of your calls and says, what are you doing? And you tell her, oh, I'm watching you know, channel seven. And your friend turns on the channel and now what does your friend see? Exactly the game at the moment because it's a live transmission. So how do we do that? Well, that's very easy to do. You can go here and say share, and, and now all of a sudden, that, uh, it's a shared subscription. So you can see how the forking works in this case, but you get to decide if these two are two separate subscriptions, or if the subscriptions are the same for the two subscribers. So here's a way to think about it. Uh, it, it took me a while to r realize this, but you know, sometimes it takes a while to learn certain patterns in life. But I came to know this a, a little while uh, after listening to my wife. Uh, when she calls me on one of my trips, I begin to realize this. When she starts the sentence saying, do you know what our son did today? Versus sometimes she'll call and say, do you know what your son did today? I kind of figured out eventually. The our son sentence starts with a praise. Your son sentence usually starts with something he's in trouble for. There's a connotation there, right? The good parts are because of the joint effort here. The bad parts are my bad influence on the child. But, but I'm okay with that. So the point really here is that uh, if you're gonna, after all, scold the child, you would rather have a joint session to scold the child, isn't it? So this is where the shared comes in. So when I execute this this time around, notice that your S1 is at uh, zero seconds, but five seconds into it, you have S2 join, and at this point you can see both S1 and S2 are seeing exactly the same scenario. So that's a join subscription for multiple subscribers. But here comes the really amazing part about it, is that you can not only have multiple subscribers, multiple tree of subscribers. Uh, so uh, uh, how is that? Because you can not only create here, but this could have been uh, uh, something like a dot filter, if you will. So a dot filter, and this could be some filtering operation, what have you, and then you could have stored that into a variable, and you could connect two subscribers, let's call it as F1 equal to, and you could connect two subscribers to uh, F1 at this point, and so as a result, you can pretty much you know, uh, go across different uh, channels and uh, different uh, trees, and you can have share at one point, non-share at one point, permutation and combination of things, you can go through that pretty nicely. So that gives you a really nice flexibility, if you will, about how you can have a tree of subscribers to connect to this, a very powerful uh, you know, uh, a concept, if you will, that, that you can benefit from. So that's basically some of the key differences between those two, is that there's a data channel only, uh, exception handled very differently through the three channels, your sequential versus parallel versus synchronous versus asynchronous, and a, a single pipeline versus a multiple tree of subscribers that gives you a lot of power to deal with on your hand. So that becomes uh, very easy to work with. So, so having said that, uh, where do, what are the key uh, players here? Well, so this brings up a very uh, uh, you know, interesting question. Uh, if uh, these things are powerful, how do we talk to these uh, things? So this is where the Reactive Streams API uh, comes about. So let's get rid of this. Let's talk about Reactive Streams API. So Reactive Streams uh, API. Uh, this is an initiative that started a few years ago. And as the Reactive APIs became more and more popular, 
there was a concern. And the concern was, uh, you know, how are we going to deal with this as programmers, especially if the APIs are diverging, that we're going to suffer because of that. So a good number of organizations got together and they said, let's do a service, let's put our heads together, let's agree on a common interface, and we will follow that. So that's where the Reactive Stream API came about. Uh, who are these companies? Well, some of the uh, teams involved in them, Justin, I'm not uh, uh, going to be uh, complete in this list. My memory is not that good. Uh, but just to mention a few of them, the Eclipse Foundation. Apparently, Netflix has some streaming problems to deal with, so they were very interested in this idea. So uh, Eclipse, Netflix, Lightbend, the creators of Scala, and the wonderful Akka library were part of this initiative as well. Uh, uh, Pivotal, uh, Reactor, and products like that, of course. So there's a lot of these organizations got together, uh, Twitter, for example, and they said, let's work on this together to create, uh, uh, define a, a, a common API. So as part of this initiative, what did they do? They created four interfaces. The first interface is a publisher. So what is a publisher? A publisher is an emitter. And the job of a publisher is to emit the data. Remember, this is an interface, right? So a publisher interface's job is to emit data. Now you're thinking, wait, you said there's a publisher. Well, if that is the case, why didn't we see one? Well, we did. We've just been seeing this quite a bit. And here is your publisher. Right there, sitting in front of you, is your publisher. If you doubt it, just click on that one and take a look at it, and notice it's a publisher, right? So a flowable is nothing but a publisher. So a publisher is job is to emit data. And that's what we've been using so long here, is the publisher that we have been using. So what is the job of a publisher? A job of a publisher is to publish data, is to emit data. So that's a very first interface. Then there's a second interface, and the second interface in this is what's called a subscriber. So the job of a subscriber is to receive the data, and so this is the tail end of it. So your publisher is emitting data on one side, your subscriber is getting the data on the other side, and it's able to process that. But in, in, in between these two, you have what is called subscription. So what is a subscription? Well, imagine you have a boy and a girl at home, and you subscribe to the science magazine. The day it arrives is called the day of war, because both the boy and the girl want to read it. So what do you do as a parent who wants to stay, uh, stay sane? You get two subscriptions to the same magazine, so the, the girl can be reading one, while the boy can read the other one, and they're not going to fight with each other. Well, there are other things to fight about, about, of course. So the point really is that you want to get multiple subscriptions to the same subscriber. So that's what a subscription is. I like to see the word subscription as a session. So this is a session between the emitter and the session between the subscriber, so you can have a context information pass through the subscription, and that's what basically a subscription is. Now, that's all good so far, but let's get back to this example for a minute. Let's remove this, and, and let's just change this a little bit to understand this idea. So I'm going to go ahead and say over here uh, a dot. Let's remove this part also. Let's say a dot over here, and a filter, and given an element, let's say element mod 2 is equal to 0, and then I'll say dot map, and given an element right here, we will say, uh, go ahead and take the value and double the value, and I'll say subscribe uh, system dot out, and we'll just say print line. So if you notice this, it's going to emit an uh, even number, and I'm going to double it, and I'm going to print it uh, you know, as it comes through. Great. However, I want you to look at this guy right here for a second. We know exactly what we are dealing with at the moment. To the left of this is a publisher. There's no doubt about it, right? Because a publisher is going to be the one emitting the data. So where I'm highlighting, the left of it is a publisher. Hey, what's on the right side? Oh, that's easy. What's on the right side is a subscriber. So left is publisher, right is subscriber, not a problem. But now, notice I have a filter and map right in between. Now, if you put your mouse here, what is on the left of this? Oh, that's very easy. What was in the past, that's a publisher. No, no surprise. But what's on the right side of this now? Oh, if that's left is a publisher, the right has to be a subscriber. Okay, 
Well, what's on the left over here? Well, clearly what's on the left is still a publisher. What's on the right is a subscriber. What that tells us is these are, are special because they are wearing uh, two hats. The one hat they wear is a publisher hat. The other hat, hat they wear is a subscriber hat. So they are both. They are the intermediaries. And they are sitting right in the middle. And they are subscriber to data from upstream, but they are emitter of the data downstream. And so they got to have some special name, isn't it? So they are called as uh, uh, processors. So what is a processor? A processor is really uh, wearing uh, two hats, a publisher plus a subscriber. That's what they are. So a processor is a combination of the two together. And their job is to act as both a publisher and as a subscriber. And so those are the four interfaces of the Reactive Stream API. So those are the four things you get out of the Reactive Stream API. You have the, uh, the publisher, you have the subscriber, you have the subscription, and finally you have the processor. And, and those are the four things. So typically, if you're going to be doing reactive programming, those are the four things you need to work with. With one thing to keep in mind, these are interfaces. So if you ask me, how does a publisher publish its data? The answer is, I have no clue, right? Because that's not part of the interface. Because your data source could be so widely different. You're, if you go to MongoDB, for example, MongoDB has a Mongo client version that can start transmitting data now as an emitter. And Mongo internally will start emitting data, and all you get is a publisher to connect to. How does it publish? It's called none of your business, right? So we don't care about it. That's their work, and they can change it later on because they are the emitters. So the specification doesn't say how to emit. The specification says that you can connect to an emitter, and you can start receiving that data. So that is basically the Reactive Stream API, and you have these four libraries provided to us, and we can work off of these four things. So this has been around for a few years. I don't remember, maybe five, six, seven years now, and it's been around for that long, and that's been fairly widely adopted and used by uh, a number of different organizations. But having said that, now that we have this Reactive Stream API, and we can use all of this, uh, programmers often ask the question, hey, this is great, this is all nice, and then they end up with the question, but what about Java? Well, yeah, yeah, you can do this in Java. You see, that's exactly what we did. You can do this in Java, right? And, and then they say, yeah, yeah, that's great, but what about Java? So what they mean when they say what about Java is, not if you can do this using Java. Obviously, you can. There are several products that can be used for doing this in Java. RxJava from uh, Netflix, right? So that's an open source library. RxJava is very popular. A lot of people use RxJava. You can use Akka. Akka is a library from uh, uh, Lightbend. Uh, Akka is a very powerful reactive stream library. It provides a lot of capabilities around this idea uh, for a greater amount of resilience and scale. Definitely take a look at it. A reactor. You know Spring 5 is heavily uh, 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 you know, focusing on this as well. In Spring 5, you have two things. One is called Flow, and the other is called Mono. Uh, flow and Mono, if you click on those libraries and look at a uh, definition of Flow and Mono, uh, both Flow and Mono both implement or extend from uh, publisher, right? So they are providing this interface as well. So there's Reactor. Uh, Vertex is a very interesting tool. Uh, Vertex uh, is, a, is a reactive library, but it's a toolkit. It's a lot more than just being reactive also. But if you are going to do reactiveness across the wire, you can do that as well. And then, of course, you also have uh, things like uh, you know, uh, our socket that's being developed. So many advances in this area as we move forward. Uh, but then programmers say, that's all wonderful, great, but what about Java? Well, the, the question there really is, you know, hey, is this something provided under the leadership 
of the JDK? Uh, is there something available in the JDK? Why are we so keen on that? Well, the reason we are so keen on that is uh, that means there is stability. That means there is a guarantee that we are going to have something uh, widely available. Uh, it gives us a com comfortable feeling that it's going to be around for a while, right? It's not something that's going to disappear so quickly. Uh, so essentially what they wanted was a Java API for this. And as a result, now we have a Java 9 reactive stream API. Now, there is one problem though. Imagine this for a minute. Imagine you are working with these teams and they have come up with this particular API and they have done this, what, five, six, seven, eight years earlier. And you come to the party pretty late. If you come to the party pretty late uh, and if you tell everybody at the party that they are wrong, and they got to do things differently. That's a way to get uninvited, isn't it? So how do you do this, right? How do you get in, go to a party late and still you know, be part of the party? Well, Java 9 decided to introduce an API. And they introduced an API and said, this is going to be the API moving forward. And every one of the other organizations who worked on this looked at this and said, we love it. And they immediately adopted it. Now, how could you possibly do that? Well, these guys are extremely smart. So they created a Java 9 reactive like, uh, API, reactive stream API. So what did they do? They decided to introduce four interfaces. The first interface they introduced was called Publisher. <laughs> then they introduced a second interface called Subscriber. Then they introduce a third interface called subscription. I'm wondering if you can imagine what the fourth interface name was. They called it processor. And they said, any questions? And they all said, we love it. <laughs> so this is how the Java 9 API came about. The only difference is, if you recollect, when I wrote this over here, this was part of the io.reactivex. So that is where the package was, isn't it? But moving forward, starting Java 9, this is going to be java.util.concurrent.flow. So this is where these are going to sit. Now, obviously, the f is uppercase f. That tells you it's a class. So these four interfaces are inner classes of the flow class, which is part of the java.util.concurrent. So that's where that's sitting. Let's quickly take a look at an example of this. So what about Java 9? So Java 9 is, uh, is, is really a blessing interface, right? So they said, we agree with all these interfaces. Moving forward, we'll use Java 9 API, but essentially, Excuse me, those interfaces are pretty compatible. So how would we use this? Java.util.concurrent. And I'm going to ask for a submission publisher. This is one sample implementation in Java 9. Now, you wonder what this class really is. So if you take a look at this class, it is flow.publisher, as you can see. So the flow.publisher, where in the world is flow? If you take a look at flow, you notice that flow is a final class with a private constructor. And, and all it contains is the interface called publisher, an interface called subscriber, an interface called, well, a subscription, and eventually a processor, which extends both a, sub, a subscriber and a publisher. Right? So that's the uh, one that wears the two hats. And so those are the four things that are part of this particular class. And those are four nested interfaces, uh, well, nested static interfaces within the flow class. That's where the namespace is. So they're sitting nicely within the fl flow, and they are part of the java.util.concurrent.flow. 
concurrent library. And, and so if you want to look at what Java 9 provides, that's pretty consistent with what the Reactive Stream API gives you, except for the different name of the package and the class that it actually contains it. Like I said, this is more of a little reference implementation, a little toy, so you could, you could try this. You could say subscription publisher integer, and I can say over here, uh, let's go ahead and provide a reference to it. We'll say publisher is equal, uh, we'll call it feed, is equal to new subscription publisher. So I created a subscription publisher right here. Now, after creating this, what am I going to do? I'm going to say feed.subscribe, and I'm going to say new subscriber. When I create a new subscriber, you can see that this contains on subscribe method. This takes a subscription. So when you register as a, subs a subscriber, you get this little token, which is the subscription. And you can take this context of subscription and you can, uh, you can work with it. So all I'm going to do is to take this subscription and I'm going to store it away into this field called subscription. On next item, all I'm going to do is simply output the item given to me. On error, this is the error channel, I'm going to output error colon, and I'm going to simply output the throwable uh, given to me. And then finally, on complete, I'm going to simply output right here, we'll say done. So this gives you an idea about how you're able to receive this on the side of the subscription. These are the three methods I wrote for each one of those. Uh, then what am I going to do? Now that I've subscribed to it, I remember the publisher doesn't have an API to emit data. But on the other hand, your uh, uh, API submission publisher has a method to push the data to words. So I'm going to iterate over uh, 10 times. And what am I going to do here? I'm going to simply say at this point, uh, a, a feed dot, and I'm going to say submit. And I'm going to submit the value i through this particular uh, submission. And I'm going to simply put a little 10-second sec delay here, and uh, let's get started with this. Well, if I run this code this time around, you will notice that, in this case, I'm going to put output. Uh, let's go ahead and say put a few dashes here to see that it's over. And when I run this, you see nothing, absolutely. And at the very end of the 10 seconds, you're going to see those three dashes. So what, what just went wrong? What happened here? Well, this is where this library is doing things a little different. It wants to subscribe, but it wants to also deal with back pressure. So as a result, this says, hey, I am the publisher here. I'm going to start emitting data. And you are the subscriber. And you can receive the data, and you can display it. But the publisher assumes the worst. That is, that the capacity of the subscriber is zero. The subscriber says, I can't handle any of your transmission. So as a result, the publisher doesn't transmit anything. So what, I, what do I want to do? I go here to the unsubscribe, and I say subscription.request1. Just give me one piece of data. That's my capacity, right? So if I run the code this time, you get that zero right there. I'm going to say, give me two. Well, when I run this, you can see it gives me two pieces of data. Well, give me five. So it gives me five pieces of data. So in other words, you can set your capacity, how much you can handle. And based on the capacity you set, it transmits that many. So think about it this way. I said my capacity is five. You transmit one, my capacity is four. You transmit one more, my capacity is three. You send me three more, my capacity is zero. Sorry, you can't send me any more. That's why it doesn't send any more than five. On the other hand, if I go back here and say, you know what? I processed one, so I request you to send me one more. Now when I execute this code, you can see that it is able to get all the data because I'm, my capacity is five. You sent me one, and the minute I finish processing it, I increase my capacity, right? So as long as I can increase my capacity, you can keep sending it to me. This is another way to deal with back pressure. And in this case, you are saying, I am not going to involve a buffering in between, but I'm going to tell you how many you can send me, and I will take care of buffering them on my set if I need to. And then when I'm ready for more, I'll request for more, and you can transmit more at that point. 
So you can start managing these things based on how you're going to send and receive this data, and that can give you a capability to set this up. So this is part of the Java 9 uh, API. Uh, having uh, shown this, if you ask the question, you know, how do I really use this in Java 9? And the short answer is, Java 9 gives you a specification. But for all real practical purposes, you really want to use another library. Whether you're going to use Akka, whether you're going to use RxJava, whether you're going to use uh, Reactor, whether you're going to use pick your version that you are interested in, depending on what capabilities you want. So you wouldn't really build a production code with the facility given in Java 9. That, that's not the real purpose. The, the purpose of Java 9 was to bring conformance of an API. Think about it like JDBC in a sense, right? You have different vendors providing you database connectors. They all conform to the JDBC API, and that gives you the stability of the API. That's kind of the intention here, is to get the stability of the Reactive Stream API with those four things. And, and anybody who's implementing things on the Java platform can conform to those four interfaces, and that gives you the guarantee that your API is going to be stable for you to use, with the generation being very specific to the data source, but you can pretty much relate to it. Uh, similarly, you can go across the wire as well if you really are interested. You could use tools like Vertex, for example, and you can start transmitting data on one uh, so, uh, 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 you know, service, uh, and then you can receive it in another service, and you can process it across the wire. And on, on both endpoints, one of the things Vertex does is it gives you wrappers around RxJava, so your code is RxJava on both of your ends, but Vertex can take care of serializing it and sending it across, so that can be a really powerful way to transmit across the wire as well. So there are different technologies you could use potentially, depending on what you're trying to do. So to summarize what we talked about, we talked about how uh, the reactive streams are different from the Java streams. Uh, to summarize a few things about it, uh, Java 8 uh, streams are really data flow. That's what they really are. And similarly, reactive streams are data flow as well. They both are built on the concept of functional pipeline and lazy evaluation. And, and, and that is a really powerful thing because when you are connecting a pipeline, if your subscriber is not connected, you don't want to waste your resources performing computations whose results are not really valuable. So this waits until a subscriber connects on the reactive stream, just like a terminal operation connects on the Java 8 streams. So they both are built on laziness. Uh, laziness leads to efficiency in code. That's one of the uh, good part, parts about it. Uh, secondly, uh, they are both pushing data. The Java 8 stream pushes data, the reactive stream pushes data as well. So they both are push technologies in that regard. Uh, having said that, the differences are wide, like we talked about. Uh, streams fundamentally are really a single pipeline of functions. Reactive streams are also a pipeline of functions, but they can be uh, you know, forked, so you can branch off and you can build a tree structure to transmit. Uh, one is a sequential versus parallel execution, the other is synchronous versus asynchronous execution, uh, and you can go uh, forward. Uh, Java 8 streams predominantly are a single uh, JVM solution. Reactive streams also are single JVM, but they can branch off using other tools across JVMs as well. Uh, if you ask me, uh, you know, people often say, is functional programming going to be a big deal in the future? Uh, I, my answer is very different these days. My answer is functional programming is not going to be a big deal in the future. Uh, it is going to be reactive programming that's going to be a big deal in the future. And the reason I say that is I see reactive programming as a really nice application of the functional programming concepts. Uh, to, to, to even realize that reactive programming is really an extension of functional programming, at least in the programming model, uh, was something that took me effort to you know, really realize that, hey, there is actually a functional pipeline I'm building on top of. So that's a very logical way to look at a system as a series of these workflow. And, and as your data flow, you take the data from one, process it, and pass it to the next one and process it. And this could be any series of pipeline. And, and in that regard, from the conceptual point of view, this is very uh, broad because it doesn't have to be the functional pipeline we see. This could be processes that come to life on a system, uh, do some processing of data, 
push the data to a, uh, to a topic on the message queue and die away. So as a result, this could be spanning across multiple machines across the network, and, and as a result, you can build a variety of these processing chains depending on what your application is. Uh, for example, you could be seeing a workflow of the data processing emerging at one point, processing through multiple systems, and then eventually arriving at a particular destination for a final processing, and that could happen as well. So it's a very vibrant idea. Uh, APIs are moving towards this direction as well. Uh, a lot of databases are beginning to uh, turn around to provide, produce reactive streams. There are a lot of libraries that are turning around to provide reactive APIs. Uh, maybe, you know, rather than the request and response protocol uh, where data streaming is needed, you make a connection, but you have data flowing through for, you know, whatever time you want to receive the data. In, in what we saw here, one of the things you can also do here is, as an example, like when I transmit this, for example, notice you're getting all the way data through nine, but I can go back to this example and say, for example, on here I could say, uh, if item is equal to five, I could say subscription dot cancel and say, bye, I don't want any more data from you. So this gives you a two-way protocol, much like how the publisher can send a complete signal the subscriber can also send a signal to say, that's enough, don't send me any more data, I'm no longer interested in. So you can see that at the end of five, it no longer is sending the data, because you as a subscriber can tell that I don't want any more data from you. So this gives a nice way for you to go across. And, and the beauty is all this abstraction is built for us, so we don't have to waste our time and effort building it. The less code we write, the less we have to maintain, and we can build on this abstraction. So, so to summarize that point, uh, I want to kind of reiterate what I started out with. So a stream is an internal uh, iterator, uh, you know, and of course represents functional uh, programming, right? So functional composition uh, and, uh, well, of course, and lazy evaluation. Uh, so that's basically really, really nice built up. On the other hand, I see reactive stream uh, are, uh, stream, uh, reactive stream is really functional uh, you know, programming uh, plus plus, and that's the reason I say that it's a functional programming plus plus, is because functional composition uh, plus lazy evaluation uh, plus uh, you know, uh, abstraction uh, on top of that, right? Um, so this is going to be uh, of that. And so this gives you a greater power on your hand. And, and once we are really comfortable with these ideas, uh, one of the reasons why these ideas are very uh, powerful today is I think you know, the world in general has become a lot more comfortable with uh, this idea. Uh, only four or five years ago, this was an alien concept for us in Java community, at least. Uh, but almost every single language that's worth its salt provides this way of programming now. And as we are embracing this more and more, uh, I think it's a really nice ripe time for us to increase the level of abstraction. And I think we are really getting there. And that's why I think uh, a reactive stream, not reaction streams. So reactive streams uh, is going to be, I think, the future. I'm already seeing this with all the libraries and uh, things evolving. Uh, maybe in the next uh, five years, uh, the APIs are going to look a lot different than the APIs that we have seen in the past 10, 15 years. Uh, definitely, I think it's uh, exciting times, uh, fun times to be programming, I think. Uh, that's all I have. Hope that was useful. Thank you.